Hello everyone. So today we are here to discuss the questions asked recently in paper one of general studies mains examination un of Union Public Service Commission. Clear? In paper one, as you may be knowing, questions were asked related to history, society and geography. Clear? Today I am here to discuss about questions and the answers which were asked related to history section in paper one of general studies. First of all, before we move on to discuss about the questions and answers, we also need to understand the trend which is indicated by the questions this time. Clear? Normally from history section, we used to get six to seven questions every year. This time also from history section, we are having six questions. Clear? But internal change is there with regard to component of history section. This time there are three questions directly from the first phase of modern India that is the company's role and very surprisingly there is no question from the much expected area that is the Indian national movement. So quite surprising trend is there this time that there are no questions from Indian national movement. Clear? Two questions are there from the company's rule that is from the middle of 18th century till the middle of the 19th century and one question from modern India has been asked from post-independent era related to reorganization of states and territories in India. Three questions from modern India. There are three questions from art and culture asked this time and again surprisingly there are no questions from wild history section this time clear so obviously the trend is a bit surprising in this time that even though questions are very straightforward and simple in nature but questions has not been asked from Indian national movement surprisingly and question has not been asked even from the section of world history clear so this surprising trend needs to be kept in mind for next year also that there can be surprising trend but most important thing and the most positive thing is questions which has been asked are very predictable in nature and those predictable questions can easily be answered. But one challenge is that when questions are very straightforward and simple, you have to write some better answers with good insight. Then only you can differentiate your answer from other candidates. If you don't write deep sighted answers, if you don't write answers with clear cut conceptual clarity answer may not be considered to be uh, considered to be with proper value addition clear so keeping in mind that even though questions were simple but answers needed to be very specific very contextual and conceptual we need to discuss the major points which were to be included in these questions which at when attempted by when attempted in UPSC examination clear so with this trend we'll move on to discuss the questions which were asked from modern Indian history this time in mains examination clear if we look into question three questions as I told you the first question is why did the armies of the British East India Company mostly comprising of Indian soldiers win consistently against the more numerous and better equipped armies of the then Indian rulers give reasons only they have asked give reasons and you have to answer this question in just 150 words clear so question seems to be very simple and easy but how to approach the question we'll discuss the answer clear meanwhile let us understand the second question clear why was there a certain spurt in for mines in colonial india since the mid 18th century give reasons you have to highlight major reasons again you have to answer in 150 words i keep on saying every year whether it is preliminary examination or mains examination with respect to history section you are bound to get question from economic impact of british rule in india and for mines was one major impact of british rule over indian territory clear third question is on post-independent era the question is the political and administrative reorganization of states and territories has been a continuous ongoing process since the mid 19th century not only after india's independence 
that is from 1850 onwards discuss with examples here the question clearly says you have to explain with examples and this question is to be written in 250 words clear so three questions asked from modern history two questions from the from the period of companies rule over india one question from post independent era and no question from indian national movement and no question from world history but a point of caution it doesn't mean that you can escape in the national movement of world history in next year you may get questions on national movement and world history so be prepared for certain surprises but at the same time if you have prepared the syllabus fully there is no point to concern you can write any answer now coming to the specific question here clear so first question we'll discuss the first question is why did the armies of the British East India Company mostly comprising of Indian soldiers win consistently against the more numerous and better equipped armies of the then Indian rulers give reasons clear first of all why you have to first of all you have to mark the keywords in the question the first is why clear the reason why did the armies of the british east india company mostly comprising of indian soldiers so mostly comprising of indian soldiers win consistently that is not sporadically consistently against the more numerous and better equipped armies of the then Indian rulers give reasons clear. So the key words in the question in the questions are that why why did the armies of British sister company, a private trading company, mostly comprising of Indian soldiers, win consistently against the more numerous and better equipped armies of the then Indian rulers? Clear. Give reasons. Answer in one fifty words. Clear. First of all, we'll identify the major reasons. Clear. First of all, I'll let you know, clear, you have to give major reasons, clear. In this question, your introductory part will be that by the middle of 18th century, British East India Company started to emerge as a political power in India, clear. So by middle of mid of 18th century, by mid 18th century, by mid 18th century mid 18th century british east india company started to emerge to emerge as political power in india your answer will start simply like this clear india then you will write that even though even though being a private trading company even though being a private trading company company it it emerged it emerged victorious against victorious against indian rulers indian rulers clear second sentence then you will come out with the major reasons so two sentences has to be written by mid 18th century british east india company it started to emerge as political power in india even though being a private trading company, it emerged victorious against Indian rulers. Clear? Indian rulers. Then next paragraph will write that major reasons, clear, that led to victory of British Sister Company can be identified as, clear? Now, which could be the possible reasons? We'll look into these reasons, clear? First of all, clear, the first major reason that can be identified is major reason is lack of the sense lack of the sense of modern nationalism 
lack of the sense of modern nationalism clear india was a mere geographical entity and people of india did not have sense of modern nationalism people confined to bengal considered bengal as their country marathas confined to western part of india considered western part of india as their country rulers of mysore considered mysore as their country meaning thereby rulers could not think beyond the regional boundaries and therefore pan india feeling was completely absent by the middle of the 18th century that is why british east india company was able to recruit large number of indians clear and since they recruited large number of indians they were termed as sepoys clear so large number of indian soldiers recruited by british were termed as sepoys and these sepoys could easily be used against another prov other provinces of india because sepoys had no hesitation defeating other powers other provinces because they did consider those provinces to be part of one unified nation so sense of regionalism dominated over sense of nationalism that enabled east india company to defeat indian soldier indian powers with the help of indian sepoys only clear now since answers since you have to ex explain this thing you can give some example also clear for example clear if we look into state of mysore clear the rulers of mysore were defeated by british with support of clear with support of british supported defeated by british marathas and the nizam of hyderabad clear so three indian powers combined together defeated the rulers of mysore that indicate complete lack of the sense of modern nationalism so first and the most important factor was lack of the sense of modern nationalism clear this is the first major reason clear second major factor that led to the victory of british east india company was lack of proper coordination and discipline lack of proper coordination and discipline among indian rulers lack of proper coordination discipline among indian rulers clear this can be easily explained with an example clear in the battle of baksar fought in 1764 clear in this battle three combined indian powers these powers were mir qasim then mughal emperor shah alam second and nawab of awadh shuja uddola nawab of awadh shuja uddola combined together fought against the british led by major hector munro major hector munro clear this mayor for officer maintained perfect discipline and coordination among in british forces and that enabled him to defeat in single stroke the three combined indian powers in the battlefield of baksa clear this clearly indicate that even though indian powers had more numerous and better equipped armies even just because with more numerous and better equipped armies they were defeated because of lack of proper coordination and discipline among indian rulers clear so this became the second major factor that led to the defeat of indian powers even though they were more numerous and better equipped armies than the army of than, than the army than the army of british east india company clear this is another major factor third major factor that led to the defeat of indian armies against british was uh, against uh, against british east india company was clear this third major factor identified is lack of unity and caste distinctions in india lack of unity and caste distinctions of indian society 
Indian society. Clear? Lack of unity and caste distinctions of Indian society. Clear? Since Indian society was divided into large number of castes. Clear? And all those castes were not basically united with each other. Caste distinctions were always there. Just because of caste distinctions are prevalent among Indian society. Clear? All the sections did not cooperate against the combined enemy that is British East India Company. Just because of mutual differences in the society, caste divided society, it became much easier for the British to defeat Indian powers. Clear? This became another major factor. Fourth major factor that the fourth major factor is treachery and betrayal. Treachery and betrayal by Indians. Treachery and betrayal. Clear? Several officers in different provinces of India decided by the British and that led to the defeat of Indian powers. Even though Indian powers were more numerous and better equipped. The best example can be defeat of Siraj Dola in Bengal in battlefield of Plassey due to the betrayal of the commander-in-chief Mir Qasim. Clear? Even the first Anglo-Maratha war was basically because of secret arrangement signed between British and Maratha leader Raghunath Rao. Just because of such betrayal and trickery also, Indian British East India Company became victorious against Indian powers. Clear? So all these major factors combined together ultimately resulted into the defeat of Indian powers, even though they were numerically far more superior and better equipped in terms of military soldiers. Clear? In conclusion, you will write, clear? Conclusion is very important. In conclusion, write that British East India Company became victorious because of our mentioned factors and that ultimately gave a sense of responsibility to national leaders to convert India, to transform India into a full-fledged modern nation-state in order to become independent from British control. This would be the answer in 150 words of the question which was asked in recent time, in the last examination. Clear? Now we'll move on to discuss about the second question which was asked. Clear? We'll move into second question asked this year in mains examination. And this question is, why was there a certain spurt in famines in colonial India since the mid-18th century? Give reasons. Here also give reasons and that too in 150 watts. Clear? So why was there a certain spurt in the famines? Again, you need to understand the key words. Why? Clear? The first key word is why? There are certain spurt in famines in colonial India since the mid 18th century. Give reasons. 150 words. Clear? So certain spurt in famines. You have to highlight the reasons since mid 18th century. Mid 18th century means from 1750 AD onwards. Clear? So mid 18th century means 1750 AD onwards. From here, the slavers of modern India starts. Clear? Why there was certain spurt? Clear? Certain spurt was largely because of expansion of political control over several provinces of India. Clear? The first major province to be brought under British control was economically the most prosperous province of Bengal. Clear? And thereafter, British started naked plunder of Bengal resources. Clear? Huge resources of Bengal began to be drained from India to Britain to fill the pockets of private investors of Britain, largely the members of Court of Directors in London. So nothing was surplus left in India. And therefore, in case of any crisis, even by natural factors, the effects were to be aggravated because of lack of resources. Clear? Just because Bengal was brought under the control and British started naked plunder, the first major famine occurred in Bengal itself. It was in the year 1770 that wiped away almost one third of the total population of 
Bengal. Clear? This forced British East India Company to ask for assistance from British government and that resulted into first regulatory act in form of 1773 Act. Clear? So, Bengal. So, first for mind that took place largely was because of naked plunder of Bengal resources in 1770. So, the first major reason would be the direct plunder would be direct plunder of resources direct plunder of resources since the conquest of bengal since the conquest of bengal since the conquest of bengal clear second major reason that led to sport in for mines in india was british policy known as commercialization of agriculture commercialization of agriculture why this is a major factor clear because of this trend known as commercialization of agriculture british east india company forced indian peasantry class to produce certain commercial or cash crops like indigo like sugar cane and other such crops clear and these crops began to be cultivated at the cost of producing the necessary food grains clear obviously when preferences began to be given to commercial crops at the cost of food grains their productivity and amount of food grains became less and less and therefore in case of any natural calamity like flood and drought lack of food grains resulted into large number of famines famines basically is defined as people being depressed or people being harassed or people being affected because of lack of sufficient food grain availability clear this got affected largely because of commercialization of agriculture that shifted the focus to cash crops in place of food grains and in case of any natural calamity lack of food grains led to huge casualty being termed as famines in india clear next major thing was industrialization in britain clear since industrialization took place in britain britain began to follow policy of one way free trade clear and according to this policy of one way free trade britain began to import huge amount of raw materials from india and began to export huge amount of finished products to india clear and this finished products when it entered into indian market it destroyed the whole self sufficient economy cottage industries of india and that resulted into rapid impoverishment of masses and this impoverishment also resulted into famines in case of any natural calamity clear so one way free trade as a direct consequence of british industrialization was also another factor for famines in india so by the from the middle of the 18th century with the conquest of bengal several famines took place in india and all these are assigned to major factors that took place clear moreover strict collection of land revenue cannot be denied a strict collection of land revenue under permanent settlement rehotwari or mahalwari settlement this forced the peasantry class to sell their lands and this just because they sold their lands they remained to be hand to mouth and in case of any natural calamity since they could not pay obviously they had to suffer casualty leading to severe famines in india so these factors like direct plunder of bengal resources the commercialization of agriculture one way free trade and strict collection of land revenue led to impoverishment of masses in india and in case of any natural calamity they had to suffer huge casualty leading to severe famines you have to identify these reasons for a spurt of famines from middle of 18th century clear so these two were questions directly from modern india that two only from company's role because we don't have any question this time from indian national movement clear now we'll directly move to one question that was asked from post independent era and that to a quite straightforward question clear we'll look into this question clear now the question is the political and administrative reorganization of states and territories has been a continuous ongoing process since the mid 19th century 
discuss with examples now here they're asking discuss with examples so you have to focus on illustrations and examples first of all the keywords the political first of all the keywords the political and administrative reorganization of states and territories has been a continuous ongoing process since the mid 19th century discuss clear so mid 19th century means basically from 1850 onwards clear now what happened from middle of 18th and 19th century that resulted into political and administrative reorganization of states and territories as a continuous ongoing process you need to focus on these words continuous ongoing process and you have to explain this process through proper examples as per the demand of the question clear first of all coming to middle 19th century clear in the mid of 19th century a popular revolt broke out in the northern and central part of india which is known as the mighty revolt of 1857 thereafter only british crown in london took the direct responsibility of looking after indian affairs and he made an announcement in british parliament that policy of territorial annexation shall be abandoned clear with this declaration only first major reorganization took place of states and territories in india the reason being clear the whole indian territory got divided into two major parts one british india and the british crown and large number of princely states to be ruled by native rulers of india more than 550 states as such came into being and this was the first clear dividing line leading to administrative and political reorganization of indian territory that is why with this logic they have asked the question from mid 19th century clear so first major alteration in the boundary of india internal reconfiguration of india was done as per the declaration done by british crown so your answer will start with this introduction you have to give contextual clarity introduction that mighty revolt of 1857 resulted into proper division of indian territory into two major sections known as british india and the princely states which marked the beginning of political and administrative reorganization of states and territories in india clear then again after this you will start with the ongoing process clear since then you write it became an ongoing process which continues till contemporary times clear then you will like in the next paragraph that in the beginning of the 20th century british governor general lord curzon divided the large province of bengal into eastern and western halves for administrative convenience clear but his real motive was to divide the people of bengal into across religious lines clear thereafter are due to swadeshi movement another agitation by indian leaders british monarch king george v made an announcement in india that partition of bengal is annulled but at the same time bengal to be separated from the hindi and uriya speaking regions of bihar and urissa so this marked another reorganization of states and territories in india in the year 1911 when bihar and urissa was separated from the unified province of bengal clear so this reorganization can also be taken as linguistic reorganization in the beginning of 20th century clear this development moreover during british rule only as per government of india act 1935 further hindi speaking state of bihar was separated from the Uriya speaking state of odisha this marked another reorganization in pre-independent era so normally it is perceived that reorganization started in post-independent era no that is why the question has been placed from mid 19th century you have to talk about pre-independent reorganization as well when india became independent it became more consistent and ongoing process as people began to demand linguistic reorganization of states clear and first such state was created in the form of andhra comprising of Ral Sima and at the same time Ral Sima and coastal Andhra clear later on Andhra got enlarged into Andhra Pradesh with addition of Telangana in 1956 
This became the first linguistic reorganization of state in post-independent era. And thereafter, on the recommendations of States Reorganization Commission, Union Parliament enacted States Reorganization Act 1956. And based on the provisions of this act, the first two states to be created on linguistic criteria were the states of Maharashtra and Gujarat in 1960 after bifurcating the large state of Bombay. This was done in the year 1960 and since then it became more ongoing process thereafter Punjab was separated from Hindi speaking states of Haryana and Himachal Pradesh. Clear? Large number of reorganization was done in the northeastern states of India when Assam was divided to create major states like Meghalaya, major states like Nagaland, major states like Arunachal and all these states came into being. Finally, in the year 2000, set of three Hindi speaking states, the states being known as Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh and Bihar was separated to create three new set of three, three states of Hindi speaking states in form of Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand. Clear? Thereafter, the demand again began to be raised by Telugu people of Telangana to get separated from Andhra Pradesh and this long agitation known as Telangana movement resulted into creation of Telangana as the latest state of Indian Union in 2014. Clear? Again, it is an ongoing process. We have to write lastly that in recent times, the Union Parliament has even abolished the statehood of Jammu and Kashmir, which has been divided in terms of two union territories known as Jammu and Kashmir on the one hand, Ladakh on the other hand. Clear? This has been done basically as the latest configuration in the political map of India. And that makes it clear that it has been a continuous ongoing process since the mid 19th century. So we have to give examples because question says explain discuss with examples. So we have to explain the examples first of all examples from the declaration of British crown then example of Bengal being separated from Bihar and Odisha then in post independent era Andhra Pradesh then Maharashtra and Gujarat then Punjab, Himachal and Haryana then northeastern states and Telangana and finally the latest configuration form of Jammu and Kashmir. Clear? You'll, at the same time, you'll conclude that creation of large number of states till contemporary times indicate regional aspirations, but national unity and integrity needs to be protected at all costs, which is the, a challenge for Indian policy makers. These are the major things to be written in this answer. Clear? So three questions to be written comprehensively. Questions may seem to be easy, but your approach and your content will fetch your marks. You need to be very specific while writing answer. And while writing answer, you need to keep contextual and conceptual clarity above the factual bombardment. Clear? Don't emphasize on factual bombardment. Rather emphasize more on contextual and conceptual clarity. Use facts and figures to justify your argument and this will make your answer highly authentic and relevant in nature. Clear? So this work to be discussed with respect to modern history. Clear? No. At the same time, Another section to be discussed, which was asked in paper one of general studies, the section is of art and culture. And here also three major questions were asked. And these questions will be discussed by Mr. Shiv Lal Gupta. So he'll continue this session from here and he'll discuss all the major paraphernalias related to the questions on art and culture of GS paper one. Thank you.
Hello everyone. Uh, I welcome all of you to the GS1 paper discussion. And in this session, as said by the sir, I am going to discuss the art in culture. So I hope all of you have gone through the uh, GS1 paper, right? So before I am going to begin, let's uh, discuss certain important takeaway from the GS1 means paper, uh, particularly art in culture, right? Now, so as we have maintained uh, uh, in our trained analysis video uh, that in last seven years, the weightage of history in the GS1 paper range between the 75 to 90 marks. And uh, as you can see, uh, 40 marks from the uh, art and culture and 35 from the modern India that makes it 75. So the first important takeaway which you have to understand is that UPSC had continued the uh, weightage uh, that is continuing from the last seven years. So overall we have 75 marks. Now second important takeaway which we have to understand here that uh, as, as all of you have noticed, there is a declining significance of the post-independence and the world history and accordingly you will find out the importance attached by the uh, UPSC to the art and culture and this is what we have to keep in mind that we are not here for PhD, we are here to clear the exam, right? So that all this trend definitely matter to us. So if we, if we look into the uh, picture, you will find out post-independence, world history, there is a declining trend and continuously there is a rising trend of the art and culture. So this is the trend that is visible uh, in the GS1 paper. Uh, this happened in the year 2018, 35 marks from the art and culture, 2020, 50 marks from the art and culture, 2022, 40 marks out of uh, 75 marks. So certainly, it seemed to be that this trend is going to be continued and uh, uh, this, this is a simple hint by the UPSC that you cannot take away art and culture for granted. You have to prepare well, you have to understand the subject. So this is the second important takeaway which we can take uh, from the art, you know, uh, GS1 paper. Third important takeaway with respect to the art and culture, this is what we have to understand See, the requirement of art and culture in preliminary is little bit factual, but if you if you go through the paper uh, in the mains, then you will find out the questions were analytical in nature in last seven years. And this trend is also continued by the UPSC even this year. So you will find out the three questions which you, you can see here. See, these questions are not factual. These are highly analytical in nature. And uh, if you have analytical skills, certainly you will be able to write. Uh, otherwise, it is going to be very, very little, little bit difficult from the, you know, uh, other subject. So this is, this is what you have to keep in mind, you know. So, so third important takeaway, when you prepare, when you prepare for art and culture from the main point of view, do not just prepare it factually, try to understand the topic analytically as well because again that they are going to be important while writing the answers. Next important thing you have to keep in mind as you can see here, if we talk about uh, trend here, as you can see, uh, the question in art and culture generally comprise from the some classical and the abstract area. So if we talk about question number 12 that talks about the Gupta period, and the Chola period, as you can see here, this is the classical question, you know, Gupta period, golden age, Chola, classical period of, uh, you know, uh, South India, certainly uh, they are important and as we have maintained in our trend analysis video, there are certain dynasty, they contributed a lot and UPSC always give weightage to such a dynasty and this is, this is very much visible in the paper as well, right. So this is the classical area, right. But again, if, if we look at the question number 1 and question number 13, particularly question number 30, 13, the significance of lion and bull figure in Indian mythology, art and architecture. Certainly, this, this, this question is not the classical one. 
and therefore this require your analytical skill as we have maintained see do you, while preparing for art and culture as well as for upsc journey we have to develop certain skill it is not just going to be you know spoon feeding you have to develop certain skill so this depend on your imaginative and you know interlinkages skill for example where do in indian mythology in indian mythology where do you see the symbol of lion for example we popularly say you know uh, uh, the goddess durga you know ma sera wali right and then you will find out the images of lord shiva you may have seen you know there is a slain tiger at the beneath of the you know the images of lord shiva so you know that kind of imaginative skill you require you know to solve the question number 3 obviously we are going to do that so these are certain important takeaway that you have to keep in mind before approaching the you know art and culture good let's continue now so as all of you can see the question number 1 how will you explain that medieval indian temple sculpture the first important keywords here is the medieval indian temple sculpture uh, represent the social life social life of those days and this is what we have to answer in 150 words for 10 mark right so if, if you look at the question carefully here then you will find out what we have to highlight here we have to highlight medieval Indian temple sculpture, right? This is what we have to, you know, understand. So, why, you know, how, why the temple sculpture, we come to know about the society of medieval India. In a simple word, that is the demands of the question. This is what we have to keep in mind. Now, so this is what we have to do. I hope what we have to do is clear to all of you. Now, what we have to avoid here. See, uh, uh, I have seen some of the aspirant while writing the mains, you know, they have talked about temple architecture. So, the first important mistake you can make is, you know, you will talk about temple architecture, not the temple sculpture. Again, if you talk about temple architecture and not the temple sculpture, then obviously your question, you know, whatever you are going to write may go wrong. So, this question is all about temple sculpture and not the temple architecture. This is what we have to keep in mind. Second important thing you have to understand, we don't have to talk about what kind of temple is, you know, sculpture were in the medieval India. What we come to know, what we come to know via the temple sculpture, you know, regarding the social life of the medieval India, right? So, this is what we have to write. I hope now this point is clear to all of you. As all of you know, uh, we divide the answers into the three part introductions, body and conclusion. As all of you know, we introduce the idea first and then in the body we try to meet the demands of the question and then we summarize and give our opinion in the conclusion, right? So the same format we are going to follow in the question number one, right? Now, uh, basically you will introduce the Let's talk about introduction here first. Now, uh, in the uh, introduction, you will basically argue that since the ancient and the medieval time, temple used to be the gathering place for the all. Apart from the religious role, it used to play the various socio-economic uh, role as well. And therefore, temple also portray the societal custom, tradition and culture of those time and age. So, in this way, you will simply introduce your topic. I hope now that point is clear to all of you. Now, what about body part then? As we have discussed, this is the most important uh, part of our answers. So, what is going to be body part here? As we have discussed, we have to fulfill the demands of the question. So, temple sculpture and the social life. So, why, you know, how, why the temple sculpture, we come to know about the social life. So, 
again uh, this question require your analytical skill so for example many of you have been to the temple so if you go to the temple you will find out there is a hierarchy of god right so if if you go to the temple you will find out there is a hierarchy we can say hierarchy or the stratification of god right some gods will have bigger image some gods is going to have um you know minor image and you know and there will be you know social order in the temple as you enter into the temple there will be you know small sculpture then bigger then bigger the main deity is always going to be you know bigger in size right and it is going to be more decorated so you know what we come to know via that we also come to know the you know the varna system and the caste system not just continued but also consolidated during the medieval so this is the way you will con you know you will uh, talk about how the temple sculpture give you idea regarding the society so i hope this point is clear to all of you uh, then you will find out most of the sculpture belong to the male god right and moreover most important god is always going to be male god so that highlight the patriarchal right most sculpture belong to the male god right so what it highlight it highlight again the patriarchal nature of the indian society it highlight that the patriarchy also continued uh, in the medieval time and again the women uh, they, they they were subordinated to the male right uh, again you will find out very few important deities were the female right so that again point to the patriarchal society and that is the second point you will talk about i hope you are clear with the second point now uh, again some of the temple like khajurao were maintained by the feudal lords so you will find out some of the temples you know they were uh temples and the sculpture they were highly decorated because they were donated and maintained by the feudal lords so you also come to know feudalism used to exist in the uh, uh medieval time then certain area certain area we will find we will find the localization of sculpture with the particular religion in certain area you will find out there was a, uh, a localization of the sculpture with the particular area for example if you focus on the northeast area here you will find out the you know sculpture of more of you know lord krishna in this area you will find out more frequently the sculpture of you know lord rama is visible right and hilly and tribal area hilly and tribal area you will find out you will get this sculpture of the you know lord shiva so that point to the fact that you know why this sculpture we come to know about the practices you know with respect to the religion of that era and the time right so this is what you can write here localization of this sculpture then you will find out slowly slowly you know the tribal gods were assimilated with the major hindu god for example lord murugan who used to be the god uh, in the kurunji area that is the hilly area later he became the you know uh, the son of lord shiva that highlight that the tribal were now converted from the tribal society to the peasant based society so this is the way you can write you know there are many point right uh, the differences in the sculpture of northern and the southern india that highlight that the society of north and the south were different then you have natraj sculpture that highlight the philosophical meaning of various mudras right and then there are the sculpture associated with the natural phenomena that highlight the society were dependent on the agriculture you know the sculpture also give us idea regarding the folklore of that time for example you have you know lord ravan trying to live the you know mount kailas that give the folklore of those area so there are you know many points you can write but again what you have to keep in mind here you have to focus on temple sculpture and how do you know about the society right 
so this is the way you will talk about you know body part and i hope now the body part is very much clear to all of you right now in the conclusion uh, you can say that temple sculpture in india was and is always connected with the society therefore the religion always remain the integral part of the indian society and then to show your interlinkages you know one of the important skill that you can uh, prove to the examiner that i also know the interlinkages so try to connect you know uh, the sculpture with the religion and religion with the society this is what done by the upsc so you know try to cover link the gs1 with the gs2 like you know the concept of secularism you know so in this way you can conclude your answers so i hope now the question number 1 is clear to all of you again if if you really uh, again if any doubt obviously you can connect to us right now let's move to the question number 2 so let's discuss the question discuss main contribution of gupta period chola period to the heritage and culture of india for 15 marks to 50 word so again as i have maintained this is the classical question right so we have to talk about contribution of gupta we have to talk about contribution of chola right to indian heritage and culture again this is the classical question all of you know gupta period is called as a perkelian age augustan age classical age golden age obviously for their contribution to the you know indian culture and the heritage similarly chola period is called as a classical age of south india so again two important you know uh, two important dynasty like gupta and chola they have contributed a lot and you know you, you will find out gupta period uh, gupta particularly in the art and culture they all, they were always important if if you analyze last you know seven years paper you will find out you know this is the era which is very very popular with the upsc last year if you can recall they have talked about the coins of gupta period prior to they have you know they have talked about golden age and so on right so this is what you have to keep in mind here now i hope uh, the the concept is clear to all of you, you know how the gupta and chola they contributed to indian heritage and the culture so this is our demand now what we have to keep in mind here see we have to talk about both gupta period and the chola period by discussing with the various aspirant who have written mains what i have come to know the aspirant you know the the problem here is they have not given justice in the sense some of the aspirant they have written you know 75% you know uh, area they have written about the gupta period and in the chola period they have just you know talked about 20 you know in a somewhat 25% see this question is all about gupta and chola obviously if you if you just focus on the gupta and if you write little bit regarding the chola obviously you are not going to fetch very good marks so you have to present the balance you have to talk about the contribution of gupta at the same time you have to con you know you have to talk about the contribution of the chola as well right uh, so this is this is what we have to keep in mind this is the one area where you know it can go wrong anyway let's directly come to the uh, you know our format introductions body and conclusion same format we are going to follow here as well uh again uh, in a simple way you will talk about you know the age of gupta is called as a perkelian augustan classical or the golden age of india or while chola is called as a classical age of south india because of their contribution in the uh, contribution to the indian heritage and culture that is the temple architecture dance painting music drama and many more area so in this way you know you will basically introduce your topic right okay then in the body part as we have discussed in the first part you will talk about contribution of gupta and in the second part you will talk about contribution of cholas 
again uh, you have many material here you know if we talk about gupta there are many main you know the problem here which you are going to face there are too many thing to write now how will you control yourself that is going to be very very important aspect here for example you have art and architecture their contribution in the field of art and architecture and even in the art and architecture you have rock cut caves like ajanta elora bag caves most of the caves were constructed during the time of the gupta then temple architecture the experiment with the nagar temple architecture the development of sikhar garbagiri and the mandap then you have coin you know arts in the coins that is you know known for its finest quality and various representation like you know tiger slaying coins then garud type of coins then you have martial quality which was portrayed there so which was not visible in the other arena so in this you know art and architecture focus on the rock cut caves again do not elaborate all these ideas try to compress right here then temple architecture and then talk about you know arts in coins so this is the first point you will cover in the second point you will cover the literature see uh, one thing you have to keep in mind here all these area can be a probable question the problem the biggest problem as i said you know to compress because all these area rock cut cave itself is a question temple architecture itself is a you know question in itself right so again uh, what you have to learn here to compress even in the literature uh, you have huge volumes and the variety of literature you have religious as well as the secular literature for example you have you know most of the ramayan mahabharat puran they were compiled during the time of the gupta period then you have drama drama of kalidas visakdat and sudrak written during the time of the gupta period then in the math mathematics and the astrology you have aryabhat surya siddhan you have brahmadat who has written the brahma siddhan and many more then you have medicine and the science you have charak samhita you have susuru samhita so you know just talk about all those you know variety of books right there is no end to the you know points in the this you know uh, here then you can talk about painting painting right so we have ajanta painting so some of the painting in the ajanta belong to the gupta age and as all of you know ajanta painting is one of the masterpiece of the fresco painting in india right so just talk about that apart from ajanta you have bag cave painting right and then you can also talk about uh, you know sculpture school of sculpture sarnath school of sculpture right so sarnath school of sculpture uh, you will find out it is co rightly commented that during the gupta period indian sculpture you know came out of the outside influence and now we are in a position to teach to the world that is the biggest contribution of the gupta in the form of the sarnath sculpture so you know as i have said there are more point to write the you know the problem is how to compress now what is the one problem done by the aspirant in the mains they have highlighted all you know most of the point here but in the chola they have just talked about temple architecture so again that shows that you are not able to balance you know the various requirement so temple architecture is certainly one of the important contribution of the uh, you know chola as all of you know chola king they they made you know hundred of temples uh, all of you know brideshwar temple then you have uh, you know gangai konda chola puram temple in fact the shiva temple of tanjore you should know that it is the largest and the tallest uh, of all indian temples you know so again uh, if we talk about uh, temple architecture you can talk about viman one of the unique features of the chola architecture is the viman then you can talk about octagonal sikhar which is visible in the gangai konda chola puram temple right and then uh, you can also talk about the dwarpal right the guardian 
uh, it be, it was started by the Pallavas but became the important features during the Cholas. So you can talk about temple architecture. Apart from the temple architecture, you will also talk about sculpture. Right. Sculpture. So again, you will talk about both stone as well as the metal sculpture. Uh, you will find out uh, the sculpture of the Chola, they highlight the socio-religious point. Uh, again, they were painted with the, uh, you know, they, they were created with the realism. And most famous sculpture, all of, you know, Natraj, Natraj sculpture. So, talk about the Natraj sculpture. Then you have painting, Chola's contribution for the painting. So, you will talk about the uh, many, you know, their painting was painted with the realism, mainly the fresco painting, Kailasna temple in the Kanchipuram. Then you have the Vishnu temple in the uh, Malayadi Pati. Uh, these are the finest example of Chola's painting. So just give the idea. And then you will talk about music. Chola's also contributed to the music. Uh, you will find out 23 pun and the 7 rag were also, you know, uh, developed during the time of the Cholas. So, that is the, you know, you will talk about Nambi Andar and the Nath Muni. They contribute a lot to the Dravidian music that happened during the time of the Cholas. And then you can talk about dance as well, right? Dance. So, you have Bharat Natyam and the Kathakali. These two dance actually evolved during the time of the Cholas, right? So, if you, if you look at here, this is this is the way you will balance, you know, while writing the answer, it does not mean that you will write, you know, 75% of your area with the Gupta and, uh, you know, you, you will just write about the Chola and that to the temple architecture. You have to give the various dimensions as well to fetch the marks. So, I hope all of you will be clear with the, you know, body part, right? In the conclusion, uh, basically you will argue that modern Hindu culture derived mainly from the, uh, you know, ideas which were developed during the Gupta age and therefore rightly called as a golden or the classical age of India. While the glorious Chola culture had a large impact on the Tamil society, in fact, many of the kingdom uh, in South India and even in Sri Lanka, they followed the uh, the temple architecture which was developed by the Cholas. So, in this way basically you will conclude your answers. So, I hope now the second question is clear to all of you. Now, let us move to the third one. Let us see the question. Discuss the significance. The first word we have to keep in mind significance. Lion and the bull figure. In the Indian mythology, and art and architecture. Art and architecture. So, again, if you, if you look at the question here, the first thing will come to your mind. This is certainly not the classical area. This is certainly not the classical area. In the sense, uh, in the sense, uh, nobody would have prepared for such kind of, you know, question. So, again, uh, as we have discussed, you know, development of skill is a very, very important aspect of your preparation. We always maintain that spoon feeding is not going to work. You have to develop certain skill so that you will be in a position to write the question, you know, which are, uh, which depend on the imaginative as well as interlinkages, right? So, what will you do in such a scenario, right? You have to imagine. You have to imagine where, you know, look at the Indian mythology. So, Indian mythology basically means here religion, right? So, where in the Buddhism, where in the Buddhism you do you see the image of lion and the bull? Brahminism or the Hinduism, where do you see the lion and bull? Jainism, Sikhism, the word Singh, the word Singh in Sikhism, lion. Right. So, you know, Ma Sera Wali, for example, you know, we say Goddess Durga, right. So, this is the imaginative things you have to develop while writing the answer. So, this is what you have to keep in mind. Those aspirant who were, 
you know develop those skills and they had the imaginative power obviously they will be in a better position to write this question uh, those who have just memorized the factual details with respect to the art and culture certainly they will find it very difficult to write those answers even though if they write uh, perhaps they are not going to meet the demand right so let's understand the demand here you have to write about the lion and the bull you know figure they are used in the indian mythology you know so what is the significance of lion and the bull figure in brahmanism right in buddhism jainism and the sikhism and how they were represented in the indian art and architecture so this is the important uh, you know the needs of the question which we have to fulfill right okay so again uh, what we are going to do we are going to follow the same pattern uh, which we have done introduction body and the conclusion in the introduction basically you will argue that from the primitive era lion and bull were the symbol of strength and the power and therefore they were worshiped as a symbol of royalty protection wisdom pride all over the world including the hinduism and the buddhism so this is the way you will introduce your topic right when we talk about lion and bull what kind of character or the quality they represent right they represent power they represent courage they represent prestige right they represent confidence you know and many more thing so they are worship for power they were worship for courage they were you know portrayed for the pride and obviously the confidence this is the way you have to you know give the idea in the intro lectures right now in the body part what we are going to do we will divide this into the two part first we will talk about indian mythology and in the second part we will talk about art and architecture use of lion and bull in the art and architecture right in the indian mythology we are going to talk about the first hinduism let's begin with the hinduism right in the hinduism uh, okay in the hinduism uh, you will find out uh, there is a you know uh, the image of narsimha also called as a nursing who is considered as you know fourth avatar of lord vishnu right so again a part lion and the part man who had uh, came to the earth to you know uh, eliminate the you know uh, evil hiranyakashipu right so narsimha who is narsimha right so narsimha is half man half you know half nar har simha right that is the lion so that is what you will talk about then uh, we can talk about uh, you know the lord shiva always seated on this slain tiger skin right so that basically highlight the victory of the divine forces over the animal instinct right then all of you know lord shiva is always worshiped in the divine you know bull that is what we call as you know lord nandi so lord nandi is basically the protector here right so again uh, you can talk about that aspect then we have goddess durga and kali they were you know represented with the lion for their shakti cult right so this is the way you will talk about you know uh, in the hinduism you know uh, when we talk about narsimha when we talk about nandi when we talk about lord shiva you know goddess durga goddess kali they were represented either with the bull or the lion right and then in the buddhist buddhism you will find out uh, next after hinduism we will talk about buddhism so all of you know gautam buddha belong to the sakya clan right the meaning of sakya is basically lion right so again that is the first linkages you can create with the lion and the buddhism here 
then you will find out uh, in the buddhist architecture lion is used as a symbol of you know protector and therefore you will find out uh, they were you know it is pro you know it is portrayed uh, around the buddhas and the bodhisattvas then uh, the the famous dharma chakra parivartan all of you know the reverse side also portray the image of the lion right then you have the you know the symbol as all of you know buddha were represented with the multiple symbol right so the birth symbol of the gautam buddha is bull right so in this way you will talk about you know buddhism the image of lion and the bull then jainism jainism so you have jainism the first tirthankar that is the rishabhnath he was represented uh, as a bull while the 24th tirthankar that is the mahavir jain he was represented as a lion so that is the part you have to keep in mind with respect to the jainism and sikhism already we have discussed in the sikhism the word singh that is the lion you know as again denote the bravery again that is you know borrowed from the so in this way you will talk about in the hinduism buddhism jainism and then sikhism there is a you know widespread use of lion and bull basically to you know highlight the power prestige uh, power prestige courage and the confidence right now next part we will talk about art and architecture right again you can follow the format you can begin from the stone age right in the stone age you have bhimbetka cave all of you know the first painting we have in the bhimbetka caves right so there is a cave painting that highlight the conflict between the men and the lion so that is the first part you will talk about then you will talk about indus valley civilization right in the indus valley civilization we have large number of the images of the bull which is represented in the form of the terracotta that basically highlight the you know power and the fertility as well right so this is what you have to keep in mind and then in fact you will find out we have discovered the double headed lion bust uh, that is made from the terracotta and that was discovered from the mohan jodaro and this is the first sculpture of lion in india right so that is also discovered from the ivc so this is the fact you can use uh, here to you know corroborate your answers then we have maurya maurya so you will talk about lion and bull were represented in the pillar you have the sarnath which is the emblem right for back to back lion then you have rampurwa you know pillar where bull is considered as a masterpiece of the indian craftsmen right so just talk about mauryas then post mauryas post maurya you will talk about you know uh, various stupa you know uh, uh, lion and bull were you know uh, represented in the form of the sculpture in the various uh, sputa uh, sorry stupa and their, their their image were portrayed on the toran toran all of you know gateway right so in sachi stupa and amravati we have the image of lion as well as the bull and then finally you will talk about you know gupta period gupta and the later gupta so here you will talk about the bull that is the nandi were represented almost in almost all the temples you know uh, uh, all the shiva temples all over the india for example you will talk about the lepakchi which is considered as one of second biggest a uh, monolithic bull in the world right so in this way you will you know give the ideas how bull and lion you know if you follow this chronology it will give the idea that you are very you know or you have not just you know written the points in fact you have organized your answers as well certainly those uh, who will be able to do that uh, will fetch very good marks now how we are going to conclude uh in the conclusion you will talk about that lion and bull they are they are the symbols of bravery power courage prestige 
and these are the symbols they are they are the important irrespective of time period so is the image of bull and the lion there was they they were worshiped as a symbol of courage and the uh, courage power prestige from the ancient to the modern time so in this way basically you are going to conclude your answers so as you can see here as you can see here the questions uh, with respect to the art and culture the question with respect to the art and culture were generally analytical in nature right so you have to develop certain skill uh, the question were not straightforward right they are analytical in nature and you have to develop certain skill to meet you know meet those requirement and as i have maintained the first important takeaway that is in the recent year there is a certainly increasing trend with respect to the art and culture as you can see even in the preliminary 2022 you will find out uh, seven question came from the art and culture and just four from the modern india right and similarly the same trend is visible 40 marks question in the art and culture while 35 from the modern india so upsc is giving you hint that certainly uh, art and culture in coming days is going to be very important and you cannot take it for granted right so and again uh, if, if you want to connect to us if you have any doubt how to prepare how to approach art and culture how to begin how to you know uh, make the notes on the art and culture or, or how to develop the skills you can connect to us on that note thank you Hello everyone, welcome to GS Core. I'm Smriti Rao. I'll be looking into the society section and this year's question paper, uh, relatively it was easy to understand. The questions are straightforward. However, the nature and complexity of the questions has slightly increased. So in general, we have seen that there are three questions which are asked in 10 markers and three questions in 15 markers. So the nature of the questions would be aligned to the syllabus itself nothing came much from the peripheral areas mostly from the core areas and in terms of the um, the previous year trend we have observed that questions from unity in diversity or the salient features section has been more this year as well furthermore we are seeing that questions are asked from the urbanization and globalization and the interrelatedness between different units more and more so we can begin with uh, analysis of individual questions The question states, explore and evaluate the impact of work from home on family relationship. Now, the framework of questions is something that we discuss in the class quite often to see that the interrelated questions or the synthetic questions come from two or more than two different sections in the syllabus. Over here, family relations is covered in the salient features of the Indian society. And when we see work from home, it can be understood as an exigency based uh, situational 
example based on the COVID-19 scenario and the broader theme can be understood under urbanization and the technological changes and the impact that they have on the basic social groups in the society. So the question is mostly straightforward and the idea over here is to understand the different impact that work from home nature has on the family relationships, right? So in terms of work from home, we generally understand it from the economic perspective, which is definitely one of the areas in which we will be focusing on. The idea is that during the pandemic, we saw that there was a lot of retrenchment, jobs were lost, and the nature of work shifted to the work from home, uh, like the model. Basically, we see that there were very few people who were able to attain this transition. And these people who did have the opportunity to work from home face certain dif difficulties and opportunities. So we can look at it both in terms of the challenges as well as the opportunities. In terms of the opportunities, we can see how it led to greater flexibility as we cut down on the travel time and we increase productivity. The work productivity is likely to get enhanced. Furthermore, we can understand that more and more people were able to access it. So even within the families, there is a need to reorient the family into family relationship in, in the sense that there was a requirement for democratization of domestic tasks. So we can say that there was equitable distribution of the division of labor at the uh, family sphere, which would uh, aid the equality of relationship in terms of the family as a social group. In terms of the challenges, we can also look at how as people were spending more time in close proximity, it could lead to a lot of tension, it could lead to distress, that could have a pronounced impact on conflict in family, family relationship. Furthermore, the conflict would emerge in the form of domestic violence. The Niti Aayog report also indicates that domestic violence enhanced significantly during this time period. Furthermore, a uh, gender-based division is also seen in a pronounced way. Uh, although one area is where we see democratization of work, the other area is also how double burden of work is seen because it is considered that it is the woman's uh, sole prerogative to take care of the household activities as well as the work. And it could also lead to some kind of a primacy given to the man in the house rather than the woman in terms of sharing a uh, technological space and so on. So we see that overall there is an implication in the psychosocial realm. Psychologically, we have noted that there is a disturbance that could occur which could lead to violence. In terms of the challenges, uh, this is the impact that work from home could have. And in terms of the opportunities, more employment, increasing productivity and flexibility in the nature of work is definitely something that can be uh, written over here. However, towards the end or towards the conclusion of this question, try to analyze which part of the syllabus this is belonging to. This is a synthetic question. This has been asked from two different parts. We are looking at family-based relationship, work from home. So you can mention towards the end that in the post-pandemic world, there is a hybrid model and work from home has become the new reality. Therefore, uh, it is imperative to note the challenges that have occurred during the lockdown period. And we can try to incorporate maybe a national mental health line or a helpline. And we can also incorporate a better understanding in the schooling, in uh, even for different women to understand that the domestic sphere, they do not really have to go through the double burden of work. So they can actually uh, engage in a dialogue and a debate. So keeping the broader syllabus in mind, this is the way in which we can approach this question. Furthermore, the question is, how is the growth of tier 2 cities related to the rise of the new middle class? With emphasis on culture of consumption. You should be able to trace it back to the key head of the syllabus. When we are talking about tier 2 cities, specifically we are looking at the change in the orientation of the society from let us say 
uh, rural to urban to probably peri urban and this is the area that tier 2 cities get developed in you can begin with a brief analysis of how um, the liberalization privatization globalization uh, area the the time period around the 1990s led to an increase in the middle class in general furthermore you can contextualize it how the post pandemic world is also looking into it but to give a brief analysis of the middle class it is imperative to look at the economic angle of urbanization and how that has an impact on the society's organization on uh, let us say the social socio cultural parameters as well so after briefly contextualizing the rise of the middle class in the lpg post lpg period you could mention what are the factors that propelled their growth wherein due to better job opportunities we see that there is more disposable income furthermore this leads to more conspicuous consumption and as the consumption increases it propels the economy it fuels the economy there is a creation of a middle class you can also mention how there is a education hub that has been created along with differential job opportunities now to further contextualize it you can mention the modern and the post modern world where we are looking at technology enhancing our work and also increasing the opportunities that we have in the scope or in the arena of employment itself so with respect to the new middle class there has been a change orientation in the occupations that are available perhaps when we talk about travel influencers in the present day context that is also one way in which we are seeing that more and more people are able to become mobile they are climbing up the social ladder because of the newer avenues that are prevalent now over here when we speak about the tier 2 cities you could also mention how they are relatively cleaner environmentally they are preferred more because the land rent is low because the job availability is now gaining scope and also there is a lot of labor that is available that can be tapped into so the potential for uh, looking into the labor model over here is high you could also mention how this leads to a leisure Uh, leisurely activities have increased we see here you can also mention the four day uh, work par paradigm that has come into th the picture where we are working for the four days and the remaining would be off or the work from home model as well now to contextualize how all of this has uh, been seen in the present day context you could further move from here to the covid 19 pandemic the post pandemic changes that have been made especially by the it companies so try to enrich the content and one way to do that is to thoroughly go through the newspaper articles there are a lot of receptive articles a lot of perceptive articles which try to analyze the current context now this tier 2 cities is exactly straight out of certain articles where they have mentioned that the big it companies are moving to the tier 2 uh, states tier 2 cities in india because after the pandemic it has been observed that people are more reluctant to move back to tier 1 cities because of the obvious rising cost of rent because of lack of flexibility because of better job opportunities that are available so what has ha what is happening right now is considered to be a hub and spoke model where a uh, big companies are trying to set up a major establishment in a big town and connect it to minor establishments in tier 2 cities so that they can reach out to the employees and they can en enhance the work productivity because a lot of people are available in the tier 2 cities 
Here you could also mention Vishakhapatnam, Trivandrum, Jaipur, Indore are certain uh, states which have seen the rise of the tier 2 cities. Furthermore, you could speak about how to enhance this entire model where we provide more job opportunities by skilling more, by incorporating technological innovation which hitherto until now haven't been accessible to the tier 2 cities. So it leads to a development at the individual level, at the group level, at the society's level and also for the entire country. You could mention certain uh, schemes such as the Digital India, the Jam Trinity, Smart Cities, how they will act as a conducive, uh, let us say, uh, they, they will provide a conducive environment to enhance the labor force participation. Now, the question has already mentioned con culture of consumption. So major analysis needs to be surrounding culture of consumption for which you can also incorporate the context and furthermore explain how the culture of consumption will lead to a better lifestyle for people in the tier 2, tier 3 cities as well. So it could lead to an overall development of the nation. And uh, with re respect to the new middle class also, more emphasis needs to be laid. So you can begin your answer either of the way, maybe contextualize it in a post-pandemic world, furthermore explain how the companies are moving to the tier 2 cities. Or if you are not aware of the changes that are happening on ground, you can briefly mention the historical, the prologue aspect of it on how the middle class actually got created in the Indian economy. And furthermore, how there is a rise of the tier 2 cities right now, also because of the culture of consumption which has increased as the disposable income has increased and the leisurely activities have also increased alongside. Furthermore, The question states, given the diversity among tribal communities in India, in which specific context should, be, should they be considered as a single category? Now, there is a previous year question that aligns to this. I'll explain the framework first and furthermore, we'll look into the key demands. The previous year question was on how the linguistic diversity exists outside of the classification of languages. This is an interesting take. It appears to be a pattern that UPSC is slowly moving towards where they mention the categorization or classification of social groups and the questions would be on the relevance of the same, the implication and the scope to enhance or to change uh, categorization according to the emerging demands. In the language based question, it was fairly straightforward because we have 22 scheduled languages, we are looking at the official language and then the wealth of the linguistic organization is uh, spread out into different dialects and languages across India. In this question, however, when we are speaking about tribal communities, at the outset itself, we know that the tribal communities are diverse. So what you can do is in the, in approaching the question, you can briefly look at the characteristics that determine the diversity of the tribal communities. You could perhaps speak about the geographical isolation, you could speak about low economical development, you could talk about the shyness away from the mainstream civilization as these are the characteristic features which um, keep the diversity alive. Furthermore, it becomes imperative to include examples. You are all aware of the different tribal groups, how you can enhance the answer is to indicate the diversity. Keep in mind that this is from the salient features section where we br briefly look into the diversities and how they lead to integration, how they lead to plurality, how they lead to accommodation. So keeping those key features in mind, try to incorporate examples furthermore into your uh, analysis. Perhaps you could mention how there is 8.6% of the population, the tribal population of which we are looking at 75 particularly vulnerable tribal groups and in terms of the scheduled tribe population, it constitutes 8% according to the 2011 census and this has been derived from 700 communities. Yet again, 
this answer can be better analyzed it can be better written if you have a thorough understanding of the current affairs why is that because there are a lot of communities that are now demanding a st status you could mention the manipur metis in this regard now this indicates why classification is important over here when we look at the scheduled tribes we look at the particularly vulnerable tribal group we look at the scheduled areas this is a classification which has already determined that this is the total tribal population in india furthermore the need for particularly vulnerable tribal group only emerged where we are looking at the significant uh, let us say discrimination that has been meted out to certain tribal groups within this stronghold furthermore you could speak about how uh, there are over 809 blocks that have been determined but about 5.5 uh, crores of tribal population live outside of this block so there are two ways to approach this one by indicating that the classification the single category is insufficient and two by determining what are the areas where these categories are actually sufficient so once you mention this categorization you can also indicate that the single category will perhaps help particular tribal communities that want to get the scheduled tribe status so that there is better availability of educational opportunities of um, let us say employment generation and so on furthermore when we look at the the tribal population that falls outside of this single categorization it emerges in the form of a demand for better categorization maybe we also need to be aware of the uh, the rural the local uh, demands that are there so that we can better tackle the issues that are seen only in the grassroots level the problem of identification of tribal groups has been seen in the previous year questions also so perhaps you can pick out call out certain keywords from the previous years try to understand the intention of the question and incorporate that in the questions in uh, the present year and in the coming years for those of you who would be giving it here you can mention how the single classification would help in tribal sub plan in financial allocation the trifid scheme you could also mention the tribal eklavya model the schools the residential schools which will be um, which have been set up in the tribal areas you could also mention the need for a national tribal health action plan because we see that one of the issues or the challenges that the tribal communities face is in terms of the low development indicators also to indicate a uh, diversity you could perhaps even mention religious diversity cultural diversity linguistic diversity but you can keep that to a brief and maybe the most focus should be on the single category try to understand the nature of the question it is not about the diversity alone it is also about the need of the classification whether that is useful if yes then for what if not then how can we enhance it so with that we can um, move forward to the next question okay this is another interesting question again from the section salient features the pulse of the section is mostly positive and by pulse i refer to where we are looking at the characteristic features which render a quality of plurality accommodation assimilation acculturation so these are certain keywords which you should have in your mind regardless of whether they are asked directly in the question or not try to incorporate these keywords in your answers because it renders a certain truth to the answer because it determines the section from which the question has been asked coming to the question it says analyze the salience of sect in the indian society vis a vis caste region religion so since this is from unit 1 where we are looking at unity and diversity we are looking at pluralism how all of this leads to accommodation we have to try to bring about those features through the answer now you can begin by a brief analysis about how india is known to be a land of plural religion many religions plural religious society which indicates that we have seen the emergence of different let us say traders travelers invaders kingdoms that have come and settled over here which have rendered it a unique character because it also leads to sub categorization or sub division of religion itself 
you could briefly mention how religion is subcategorized in the uh, in the terms of the sect for now you could ignore cult the brief difference between sect and cult is just this that the sect is seen in a positive connotation the cult is seen in a negative connotation both happen to be divergent forms of the mainstream religion the sect however has certain initiation rights it could hold on to certain ideas and the membership would be in, uh, exclusive the cult is seen in the negative format it could be problematic for the individual it could cause chaos it could be violent in nature therefore problematic for the society and which is why it is not incorporated in this question because the pulse is positive it speaks about the unity in diversity about plurality now since we have established that there has been creation of different cultural groups, different groups within the religious uh, community, it's imperative to mention the type of sect that are seen in the Indian society. Since you have read about it, you could briefly mention under Hinduism, Shaivism, Shaktism, Vaishnavism. Okay. You could also mention the under the Sikhs. Nirankari and Namdhari cult, Jains, Shwetambar and Digambar, and uh, Sunni and Shia, Protestants and Catholics. This is important, even though we are all aware of these categories and it seems too generic. This is important to establish that the sect shows that there is plurality, shows that there is uh, there is a room for groups to decide on their own whether and how they want to organize in the society. After a brief mentioning of the sect, you have to look at the relationship that it has with other social institutions for which one of the ways to approach is to ensure, to show that sect, caste, region and religion are collectively forming a multicultural society. That means in India, we see that religion is closely linked to other aspects such as the subdivision of religion in terms of sect such as caste and region for caste yet again you can mention how there is again subcategorization we have seen how there is varna jati and the crystallization into caste based groups which indicates that all of india has certain subgroups in terms of occupational jatis and they are organized in terms of the Chaturvarna Ashram. So, caste as a crystallization of different social groups. In terms of religion, again, we have already established that religion, uh, the subdivision of religion looks into the sect like formation. The region is specifically important over here. It's like a keyword which looks misplaced, but how you can incorporate region is by indicating that despite different people following a single re uh, religion in India, for instance, if you're speaking about Hinduism, within Hinduism, we have a subsect called Shaivism, and this subsect also does not see uniformity because it is split into geographical practices or which are divided on the basis of the region. So, the Shaivism that is practiced in let us say Karnataka is very different from one that is practiced in Kashmir. Why are we writing this? To bring about a relationship between the sect, caste, region, religion but most importantly, to indicate that this shows that there is plurality in the Indian society, various cultural practices are determining the nature and orientation of the society and we don't have to look at a particular classification vis-a-vis -vis the other but in totality. So, you can bind your entire argument by looking at the multicultural nature of the society and how religion, caste, cult, region are all uh, combined and it's a multi-dimensional process in which they are seen. Uh, you could also mention the Veera Shaiva sect over here because that, uh, recently in the current affairs itself it's seen how the Veera Shaiva sect, the Lingayat uh, sect would want to be recognized not as a sect but as a religion. But you don't need to go into too much of the debate. Keeping the pulse in the mind, 
you should be able to analyze that this question comes from the first section. We are talking about unity in diversity. Try to incorporate examples to show how there is plurality, to show how different social cultural groups have been accommodated. In your answer, try to use key terms such as accommodation, assimilation, integration, plurality and collective living. Then we can move on to the next question. It says, are tolerance and assimilation and pluralism the key elements in the making of Indian form of secularism? Yet again, we are looking at another question from Unity in Diversity or Salient Features. And as you will be wise to note that these key terms often tend to get repeated in the question. One way to approach an answer is to define each of the key terms, but I would suggest against it. What you can instead do is organize your answer in such a manner that the key terms are reflective in different points. How to do that? Let us let us look into that. But before that, unity and diversity in the second area is secularism. This is a synthetic question. They have combined two different units to create this. But the pulse of this question yet again looks to be positive because we are trying to look at co-living and how secularism enhances assimilation, plural, uh, pluralism and tolerance. Uh, in this regard, again, you can approach it in a chronological manner. You can look at it from the historical perspective. You can mention how India has witnessed various traders, travelers, invasions that have uh, exposed the Indian subcontinent to different religion, different culture, which has actually led to the assimilation of different cultures assimilation here refers to the process in which there is a let us say a minority and a majority group and the characteristics of the group are absorbed into the majority group so when we are speaking about tolerance tolerance itself refers to how we are allowing differences to coexist in our midst so you have to mention why there is tolerance in the first place that there are different social groups that are coming from the outside which are culturally oriented in a different manner and this coexistence or this assimilation only happens because of the principle of tolerance. You could mention any kind of invasions that come to your mind, any examples that you deem fit to analyze this. Furthermore, when we speak about um, the concept of secularism in this regard, what you can do is you can do a brief analysis of religiosity and religiousness to indicate how the public practices religion in a particular way to indicate how the cultural ethos of the nation determines the individual's religious practices for which you could mention um, the report that was conducted very recently by the World Values Survey and Pew Research. Yet again, current affairs do come in handy for content enrichment. So according to this survey conducted in 2021, we see that about 84% um, of people in India continue to practice dharmic faiths, which is in contradiction to the entire global scenario where religiosity has been declining globally since 2007. Furthermore, we see that in the idea of what should the nation be, how should the nation be organized, what is the governance model, in these determination, we see that people are still united. People belonging to different walks of life, to different religious communities, caste, gender even. They all agree on certain principles which are more secular in character in terms of how the nation must be organized. So establish a interlinkage in your answer. Briefly begin by analyzing what is this tolerance? Why does it come about? Especially in a multi-religious uh, country like India. Furthermore, you can use some current affairs analysis, some statistics to build on your argument where you can mention the world values uh, survey and the pure research. Furthermore, to establish relevance in the uh, later half of the answer, you can also mention how the ideals of the ancient Indian tradition in terms of ahimsa, karma, swadharma, swabhava, these have led to incorporating secularism in the midst, in, in our cultural practice. So Indian secularism is particularly important over here because it was a part of our life, it was a way of life, rather than some new political changes happening, which would suddenly create secularism as a new term. 
Here you can also establish relevance by differentiating between the Western model of secularism and the Indian model of secularism. You can state here in a very brief one or two lines how in the Western model we see that secularism refers to separation of church and state. But in the Indian model we see secularism has been incorporated in everyday life. It is a part of the civilizational ethos of our everyday culture. You could also briefly incorporate uh, the constitutional framework article 25 to article 30 to show how there has been institutional support to enhance secularism. If you want you can quote Nehru, you can briefly look into the idea of secularism, how we are diverging from the religious dogmas from ancient tradition texts which are problematic by incorporating the secular idea. La by and large this the pulse of this question is positive so you have to ensure that you stick to the narrative of the answer. Do not start writing um, any kind of challenges in the midway. Because of course, when we look at the term secularism itself, we see that there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of areas which are problematic conflict areas. But it's imperative to catch the pulse of the question. And as this question shows, it is a synthetic one between unit uh, one in, in terms of unity in diversity and salient features and secularism. So maintain that tone of answer, briefly differentiate between Indian and Western secularism. Apart from that, that, this is a pretty straightforward question and the idea of using key terms also shows that the trend has been maintained along by UPSC. Okay, so this one question from globalization um, is distinct. Let us see what it states. Elucidate the relationship between globalization and new technology in a world of scarce resources, scarce resources with special reference to India. Now, the unit on globalization is lately garnering a lot of attention. Even in the last year, we saw questions such as gig economy, cryptocurrency. Even this year, we are looking at the new technological implication. One thing over here is that we can mention how new technology is useful in a general parlance in terms of new economical opportunities, new job opportunities, new academic opportunities, so on. But here the question specifically mentions scarce resources. So if you have uh, studied thoroughly, you would also come across this term in population dynamics where we look at Malthusian analysis of how scarcity of resources is going to be a problem in the long run because the population is exploding and the resources are growing in an arithmetic progression. So geometric arithmetic progression, but it was proven false with new technology. So you can establish link to that somewhere and then you can move on to globalization as the context in which the answer is uh, placed. Here again, in terms of scarcity of resources, you can mention the report by Ministry of Statistics and Programming, which states that 11 states have shown decline in natural capital in the last decade. Furthermore, uh, in the six years, the growth of forest stock has reduced by 10%. Try to incorporate certain kind of statistics which you would have read in your uh, current affairs analysis to provide a dimension, to provide a context in which we can analyze these things further. Now, in terms of globalization, since the question revolves around that, you can mention new technology such as artificial intelligence, uh, data learning, machine learning, data analytics. Mention these briefly and try to move on to how they have an impact on scarcity of resources the direct impact that we can see is in terms of agriculture. So you could mention agro -volt uh, voltaics, smart irrigation, uh, soil health card, remote sensing, usage of biofuels and regenerative agriculture, which could lead to reduced ecological footprint. Now, there's another interesting thing that you can mention over here, an example of Japan, how we have the... Um, the mercury, uh, the issue of mercury pollution, which was tackled by the Minamata Bay. Here, the laws were organized in such a manner to reduce the impact of pollution on the society. Eventually, what would happen that yes, there will be less ecological footprint, but it also enhanced the new technology. Automobiles that were being created by Japan around that time period were considered to be world class. It enhanced the economy, it increased the GDP, it boosted the growth of the uh, economy despite having issues with the ecological footprint. So eventually it's almost like hitting a bird with two stones where we are using sustainable development and there is an efficient usage of resources 
Furthermore, the ecological footprint has come down. The production has en enhanced in, in such a manner that it had become it has become the uh, global it has tapped the global market for the automobile. So to analyze it in this manner, where we look at economy in terms of scarcity of resources, new technology in terms of innovation and uh, interlink it to sustainability. Now, this is a model that you can briefly look into and mention how India can learn from this. India can ensure that the new technology, which is seen in other parts of the world, can be effectively tapped due to the process of globalization and it can enhance the uh, resource optimization it can allow us to uh, uh, attain sustainable development in the long run furthermore you could indicate wash initiative land use patterns certain uh, other things you can incorporate to make your answer more multi-dimensional now keep in mind that these kind of questions require you to be analytical they need you to understand what is the key demand and how to go beyond the syllabus so the terminology and the interlinkage of questions is more and more analytical thereafter we don't see any direct questions so try to interlink different components of the syllabus and establish a logical flow between these the other area over here is to ensure that there is current affairs analysis for content enrichment. Now, the basic and static content which is used in every answer is relatively same. We also see that the pulse of every section is relatively the same. However, how can we enhance our answers? Perhaps by looking into the key terms which are used in previous year questions, number one. Number two, look into the framework of the question. The, uh, the questions on categorization and classification into different social groups is something that we that I believe would be a repeated pattern in the years to come. So try to look at it in this manner that there is an established classification or categorization or static part and how do we go beyond that? How do we move beyond that? Also interlinking between different components. This is something that we teach in the classroom also how to have an integrated approach to society because none of the questions are straightforward anymore. So try to understand the interlink between different components. The society section is not that complex. The only complexity lies in understanding how to interlink logically the different components. What are the key terms that you can use? How should the answer have a flow? How to distinguish the answer from a very generic one to a specific one? So try to uh, analyze the questions in this manner and with content enrichment, I believe this is a doable task. With this, we will wrap the section on society up. Welcome friends, welcome to GSS score. <clears throat> My name is Ruchir Kumar and I shall be discussing UPSC GS paper 1 for 2022 that is the mains examination, the section on geography. We shall be discussing each and every question and I will give you a pragmatic understanding and a comparative analysis with last year uh, UPSC GS paper 1 and this year's paper. <clears throat> so let us have a look. Just have a glimpse at the questions that have been asked by UPSC this year on the topics geography GS paper 1. <clears throat> Describe the characteristics and types of primary rock. Discuss the meaning of colored coded weather warnings for cyclone prone areas given by Indian Meteorological Department in 150 words. If you look at these two questions, the first question describes the characteristics and types of primary rocks. 
In 2021, there were three questions from geomorphology, and this year we are having one specific question from geomorphology, and it is more or less a direct question. If you look at past few years of UPSC, then almost since 2013, even uh, two or three years before that, there had not been a single question which is a direct question based on geomorphology. The applied knowledge of geomorphology, in fact, it is a question on geology. A direct question. Describe the characteristics and the types of primary rocks. Now, it is a basic and a direct question which has been asked by UPSC after a long gap of time. There were questions on landslides. There were questions on the formation of fold mountains. There were questions on the after effect of the formation of fold mountains and so on. But a direct question from geology has been asked, asked after a long gap of time. Discuss the meaning of color coded weather warnings for cyclone prone areas given by Indian Meteorological Department. Now again, disaster always remains at the center of discussion, be it your newspaper, be it your magazines, or be it any issue in the contemporary world politics. Disaster is always at the center stage and cyclone is one of the favorite areas of UPSC. UPSC has been asking questions on cyclones in last years and the trend is continued even here. But in this, uh, this same, they have asked an applied portion of uh, on this particular topic that is cyclone and they have asked about color coded weather system that what is the color coded weather system if we talk about last year's then last year also questions were there before that questions were there but in last two or three years there had not been a single question on climatology directly and this year we are having a question we'll come to that discuss the natural resources potential of Deccan trap again if you go and have a look at the natural resources section of India. Every year or second year or with a gap of one year, there is a question on natural resources. Sometimes it is linked to any other energy resources, sometimes it is linked to forests. And now they have asked a question on the potentials of Deccan trap. Now, what is exactly the Deccan trap? That will be <coughs> the subject matter and how it is having different types of resources which are having potential. They are yet not being used, but they are having the potential to be used in future. Examine the potential of wind energy in India and explain the reasons for their limited spatial spread. Now again, as I told you, natural resources, energy resources are the thrust areas of UPSC. We are having a question on wind energy. 2020, 2020, one year back, there was similar question on solar energy. That what are the uh, potential of solar energy in India and how it can be harnessed. It was something like that. After a gap of one year, they have asked a question on wind energy. So energy resources, if we talk about 2021, they have asked about the distribution of mineral oils. Now mineral oils are again related to energy only, right? So energy resources is one of the thrust areas, just like natural resources. And every year, if you see, 2020, we get, uh, we get a question on solar energy. 2021, we get a question on distribution of mineral resources. And now we get the question on wind energy. So this is the trend. UPSC is giving required emphasis on energy resources or natural resources only the content and the subject matter is changing and the area is picked by UPSC. What are the forces that influence ocean currents describe their role in fishing industry of the world? As in 2022, almost similar, in fact slightly more diversified question has been asked in 2015. A direct question has been asked on ocean currents and it is influence on fishing and along with that navigation was also asked. So again it is a direct question on ocean currents and there was no question on oceanography for past few years. <coughs> so we get a question on ocean currents. Describing, describing the distribution of rubber producing countries indicate the major environmental issues faced by them. Now. Distribution of rubber producing industry. Rubber had been at the center stage of discussion throughout last year, since last year up till now. Rubber industry is facing some hard times if we can talk about our country, India. And so we get a question on rubber producing industries. If we relate it to agriculture, then again there was a gap. There was no question on agriculture in past few years. And now a subtopic from agriculture has been asked by UPSC. But again it is a mix of static and current. You have to relate it to the current scenario. Only then you will get good marks. Mention the significance of straits and summers in international trade. Again an applied portion of a static question. 
isthmus what is isthmus what is straight given very much in the ncrt of class 6 only they have defined that what is isthmus what is straight you have to mention the significance of a straight in isthmus in international trade international trade is the crux is the baseline uh, which decides the bilateral trade bilateral relations right so if isthmus and straits are having their say are having their role in international trade we have to highlight that and we have to write that in a proper sequential manner the last question that was asked on this uh, subject geography troposphere is a very significant atmospheric layer and that determines weather processes how if we look at the trend analysis then in last two years 2020 and 2021 there was not even a single question on climatology direct question on climatology here we are having a question after a gap of two years on the question on troposphere if you look at the trend if you look at the online video that has been up uploaded on our website which is related to PYQs. In that, I have discussed about the trend of UPSC. It was uploaded around a month back, or uh, one and a half month back. And at that time, I have spoken out in that video that in this year, 2022, you are supposed to get a question on energy resources, natural resources, oceanography, and climatology. And we are having questions on that. I was also anticipating a question on industries, which is exactly not there, but these four areas were highlighted in that video in which I, I had already anticipated that these questions might come up in 2022 means GS paper 1 for civil services examination, right? If we look at the trend of UPSC, many a times by going through many of the questions, we are having a general idea that UPSC is sticking to certain topic and the language, the applied section and the nature of the question is changing, evolving with the years to come. As I explained to you about the ocean currents, it is happening like that. If, as I told you about energy resources, it is happening like that. So the proper areas on which UPSC is having the focus are determined and they are being evolved year after year. And so we are getting a variety and a diversity of questions that have come up in the examination. If you look at this entire paper, if you look at the paper directly, then barring one or two questions, none of the questions are very specific. They are very generalized questions and anyone, anyone who is not even an aspirant for UPSC will have some or the other subject matter to write on these particular questions, right? When the question becomes generalized, then your input is almost double. You require more efforts, you require more proper understanding, you require a proper synchronized uh, answer in order to secure good marks. Because if the question is specific, then the content is also specific. But as the question becomes diverse, it becomes generalized, then your aptitude, your ability to interlink the subjects, your ability to interlink and connect the topics and jot down there in your answer sheet becomes a challenge. And if you are successful in doing that, then you will get good marks. Again, it is a generalized paper. And UPSC is making its paper generalized, more and more generalized day by day. So you have to work accordingly. Now let us discuss each of these questions one by one, taking each question in detail. Have a look. Have a look at this particular question. Describe the characteristics and types of primary rocks. Now, question is composed of two things, two parts. One is the characteristics and the types of primary rocks. As I already told you that this is one of the question that has been asked directly on geology after a long gap of time. And the question is more or less a direct. There are two parts of the question, the characteristics and the types of primary rocks. So you need to have an understanding. You need to put in there that what are the primary rocks? What can be the types of primary rocks? 
and what are the characteristics. If you go into the details of this particular topic as per the entire syllabus of geography, then it will become quite cumbersome. Why? Because there is no end to this particular topic. But you have to keep in mind that this is a 10 marker question. So you are supposed to finish up your entire content in just 150 words. In order to focus on those 150 words and to answer the question completely, you need to You need to understand that what are the types of primary rocks. If we have to look about the types of primary rocks, primary rocks can be categorized or what are basically primary rocks? Primary rocks are those rocks which are formed directly. The original rocks that were formed at the time of formation of earth, which are directly formed by the solidification of magma, by the molten material which solidifies and results in the formation of rocks, they are called as primary rocks. So alternatively, primary rocks are the rocks which are called as igneous rocks. As per the rock cycle, we are having three types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic. Igneous rocks are called as primary rocks. Question is asking what are the types of primary rocks, so you are supposed to give a general one line statement about the igneous rocks, that the rocks which are originally formed from the molten material that is a magma, it, the solidification of magma results in the formation of rocks which are called as igneous rocks. Now the question arises what are the types of primary rocks, if we talk about the types of primary rocks we are having basically two types of primary rocks, one is called as intrusive and the other is called as extrusive. Intrusive primary rocks and extrusive primary rocks, when the molten material that is the magma is able to reach the surface of earth and then it solidifies uh, which results in the formation of rock, it will be called as extrusive because the exposure of magma to the atmosphere takes place or exposure of magma to oceanic water takes place. Whether it is the oceanic bottom or the continental crust, material has to be exposed and it has to move out of the crust for it to be categorized as extrusive. If the same molten material solidifies, cools down below the earth crust, it is not exposed and it uh, solidifies below the earth crust, then it is called as intrusive. So if the material is solidifying below the earth crust, it will be called as intrusive, extrusive that will make that answer, that will help you to answer the types of primary rocks. Now when what is the difference between types of primary rocks when it is intrusive or extrusive? That is also the requirement of the question. When the molten material moves out and solidifies on the surface of earth, then sudden cooling takes place. And when the same material solidifies below the earth surface, then the cooling do takes place, but it takes a longer period of time. When the cooling takes place slowly, and here it is fast cooling. So solidification is slow process over here and the solidification is a fast or a rapid process over here. When solidification takes place very quickly, then the grains which are formed are very small in size. Grains are what? Suppose here we are having the molten material and it has to solidify. When the solidification starts, when the cooling starts and it transforms into solid acid, then the process of solidification starts at a specific locations and these locations are called as nuclei. These are the nuclei around which the process of solidification starts which further enlarges in size and the process of solidification continues and finally this entire material gets solidified, right. These small nuclei which, which gets formed, it results in the formation of grains. The size of the grain which is formed in intrusive cooling is large. It is having large size grains. Here the size of the grain is comparatively small, rather it is negligible if we compare to intrusive cooling. So when extrusive cooling takes place, then cooling takes place at a fast rate, solidification is very fast, quick and rapid and small grains are formed. When it is intrusive, then slow cooling, cooling takes place and the size of the grain is comparatively quite large. When the cooling is fast and we get 
the magma or the lava exposed to the surface, then the rock which is formed is called as basalt. When the cooling takes place inside the crust at some particular depth from the surface, we get the formation of granite. Again, we can have n number of examples for them, but we have to remember we are writing for a 10 marker question and we are writing in the paper of GS. It is not the paper of geography optional, right? So, even if you are a student of geography optional, then you have to limit your discussion over here because you are writing in the paper of GS and that too only for a 10 marker question. When the cooling is slow, the size of the grain is large, it results in the formation of granite. When the size of the grain is small, it results in the formation of basalt. Basalt will be formed exposed to the surface and granite will be well below the surface. What is the difference over here? When granite is formed, then it remains below the surface and over the period of time by denudation, by erosion or by upliftment, if the same land mass emerges above or due to erosion, the top layers are removed, only then the granite is exposed to atmosphere. But, but by that time, rock is already formed. If we talk about the basalt, then basalt is already on the surface and it is formed exactly on the surface only, right? So when the basalt gets formed, then it is, this rock is generally found as a spreading as a layer over a large area. The reason is that generally basalt is formed by a lava which is called as basic lava and generally granite is formed by a lava which is called as acidic lava. Acidic lava is high in silica content. Due to high silica content, we have there is more presence of gases over there. As a result, it becomes viscous. But if we talk about the basic lava, it is felsic. It is having more fluidity. So, due to high fluidity, basic lava spreads over a large area and that is the property due to which we get the formation of basalt. Basalt is a specific type of rock which over the period of time denudes, uh, denudes down and results in the formation of black soil. Due to basalt, we are having the black soil area that is present in Deccan area. Granite is a very hard strong joint surface. It is a very hard rock and that is found at certain depths. It is having high economic value as well and that will be sufficient to answer this particular part of the question that is the types of primary rocks. If we talk about characteristics, then I have already discussed few of the characteristics as well. Granite is having large grains, basalt is having small grains. If we talk in general about the primary rocks, then primary rocks are igneous rocks. They are formed by hot molten material and that hot molten material is, is having so high a temperature that it is unsuitable for fossils. Even if fossils are there, then they will be destroyed by fire. As a result, fossils are almost absent in primary rocks. If fossils will be absent, then the crude oil or the fuels will not be there. However, it may have presence of some minerals depending upon the magma or the molten material which, uh, which has resulted in the formation of primary rocks that will decide that what set of minerals are present. Generally at least one mineral you may find in the primary rocks. For example, when we talk about the basalt, then in basalt it is poor in nitrogen. So urea has to be used over there, right? So it becomes different rocks are having different properties which depends upon the nature of magma or the molten material which is responsible for the formation of rocks. If we talk in general about the characteristics, then as I told you, they are formed from the molten material, so they are very hot, they lack fossils and since they are primary rocks, initial rocks which are formed by molten material, they may have the presence of minerals depending upon the molten material and the depth from which they are coming. The entire matter has to be written in a synchronized manner so that a proper flow is provided to the person who reads your answer, to the examiner who is correcting your answer sheets. That has to be there, that has to be kept in mind. Now, let us have a discussion on this another question, next question. Discuss the meaning of color coded weather warnings for cyclone prone areas given by Indian Meteorological Department. So what are exactly the cyclone that needs a basic introduction? Then what are the color codes which are to be deployed, which are deployed by the IMD for warning? 
Now, if you look at the entire question, question is simply asking, discuss the meaning of color coded weather warnings for cyclones. Question is only asking, what is the meaning of color coded weather warnings? But it is related to cyclone and it is specified Indian Meteorological Department. So the question is specifying on the uh, focusing on the cyclones of India, right? If it is for focusing on the cyclones which are experienced in India, it means it is talking about tropical cyclones. If we talk about cyclones, we are having tropical cyclone, temperate cyclones, polar vortex cyclones, but here it is focusing on tropical cyclones. So if tropical cyclones are being focused, you need to give a very short, a single sentence statement about the tropical cyclone and its uh, meteorology that how the cyclone moment takes place and it is considered as a disaster that's it because you have to restrict your content in 150 words then color coded weather warning discuss the meaning the keyword over here is discuss it means you are supposed to discuss you are supposed to write pros cons and then the conclusion in the way forward right that is discuss so discuss the meaning of color coded weather system if we talk about the color codes Four colors are being used, green, yellow, orange and red. Whenever a cyclone is anticipated or a cyclone is projected, then these are the four color symbols which are used by the IMD in order for the cyclone and they are associated with different stages in the development of cyclone. Green is basically something that is considered as normal so when there is everything normal it is called as a green cyclone in fact the formation of cyclone has not yet started as soon as it comes to yellow then it is called as pre cyclone watch and it is given generally 72 hours before the cyclone may hit the coastal area Pre cyclone watch, cyclone is still in the pro, a stage of formation and it is a general warning to all the people for everyone to remain to have some knowledge that a cyclone may hit in the coming days. Still the information is not clear, the timing of the cyclone is yet not clear but as per the anticipation this yellow color denotes a pre cyclone watch. Orange is called as cyclone alert. Cyclone alert means the IMD specifically alerts all the people, the government uh, officers, the disaster management forces deployed over there to remain on alert. It is given almost 48 hours prior to landfall and it also declares the timing of landfall. Landfall means when the cyclone will hit the coastal area and the location where the cyclone is expected to hit the coastal area that is denoted by the color orange and finally the red color is post cyclone landfall a post landfall once the landfall actually take place that a cyclone has reached the coastal area and now cyclone is a disaster over the inhabited land area over the human habitation then it is the red alert it is after landfall and it sets all national disaster management force, state disaster force all into action along with specific guidelines are given which should be followed by the people and it remains in such a situation till the cyclone lasts. So this is the color coded weather warnings for cyclone prone areas given by IMD. But how to make your answer specific? Every single individual who will be writing the question or who has written the question for this exam for this particular question they will be writing this right if you want to get enhance your answer you are supposed to draw a simple outline map of india just a coastal map of india you are not supposed to draw the land boundary map of india and on this coastal map of india you simply do what mark the areas which are prone to tropical cyclones all along the eastern coast of India, mark this color, mark over here, mark over here, the areas which are prone to tropical cyclone and then on this map only, you can specify that the western coast of, sorry, the eastern coast of India is more prone to tropical cyclone as compared to west coast because 
tropical cyclone once formed always moves under the influence of the trade winds and the trade winds over the indian subcontinent in normal circumstances are from north east to south west this is the direction of trade winds and a cyclone is bound to hit the eastern coast of india even by experience uh, by our experience we know that west bengal odisha andhra pradesh tamil nadu are more prone to tropical cyclone as compared to kerala goa karnataka maharashtra and gujarat because generally the trade winds are moving in this manner if the cyclone gets developed at the time of monsoon then it may have a different trajectory as well but generally west eastern coast of india is more prone to tropical cyclone as compared to western coast of india so this map will enhance your answer if in writing this answer you fall short of these 150 words then that can be incorporated that should have been written over here over here in the map which will not be counted in the world limit right this is for this particular question next question discuss the natural resource potentials of deccan trap answer in 150 words now have a look again natural resource potentials it is not asking only about the natural resources available rather the term that is that has been used is potentials it means whether they are being exploited they are being used they are having economic use yeah now or not that has not been that has not been asked what has been asked potentials whether the potential is there or not of what deccan trap discuss the natural resource potentials of deccan trap again it is a 10 marker you have to write in 150 words so you will have to restrict your knowledge specifically those students who are from geography optional they have to restrict your knowledges but you need to explain what is meant by deccan trap a single line statement deccan trap was formed by hotspot volcanism that was active near reunion islands of present when indian plate was crossing that region then hot uh, this lava got spread over almost 9 lakh square kilometer area which resulted in the formation of deccan trap some part of that section got subducted in the ocean and the remaining part that is present over the region of gujarat maharashtra some part of rajasthan some part of madhya pradesh parts of karnataka and goa that is deccan trap at most you can draw again a small map outline map and show the region as the deccan trap and mark this region as the deccan trap that is the <laughs> that is known as deccan plateau of india this will be a basic definition this figure will enhance your answer and the natural resources potential of deccan trap now you have to write about the natural resources potential what are the natural resources potential so the current resources and the upcoming resources which are having anticipation to be discovered from or they are having some they are already in the pipeline as per this region that have to be jotted down here now what can be the natural resources potential for this particular section you will have to think in detail now have a look what can be the natural resource potentials first of all those resources which are already present the first natural resource which is present over here is the black soil region deccan trap is formed from basaltic lava that lava resulted in a, that basalt resulted in the formation of black soil black soil is having specific properties that it is it is having clay uh, texture it is having more of clay content if we talk about soil profile soil is made up of sand silt and clay here the content of clay is maximum as a result the size of the soil particles is minimum if we compare it with alluvial or sandy or red and laterite soil then the size particle is minimum in size and thereby the water retention capacity is maximum why because the interparticular space in between the soil particles in black soil is comparatively very less and so it retains water for a longer duration of time due to this water retention capacity this soil is ideal for those plants for those crops for those type of agricultural produce which need moisture in the roots but not in the atmosphere not in the weather around them so cotton becomes one such crop which requires moisture in the soil but if humidity is present in the weather then the cotton walls will collapse and they will not be having any economic value so black soil is also called as 
cotton soil. Apart from cotton, this area is also known for growth of sugarcane. Along with that, soya bean. So it is a resource potential because these products, these agricultural produce are suited to this black soil and black soil is a typical <coughs> typical to Deccan plateau. No other section in India is known for cotton cultivation. Think over that. The first <coughs> cotton mill of India was established at Fort Gloucester, 1818 Kolkata, but that had to shut down. That was the not that is not a black soil area because cotton grows somewhere else and the industry somewhere else will not be much favorable as a result it is a localized industry so that black soil becomes one of the parameters natural resources potential of deccan traps so black soil is one of the parameter apart from that you can write about the mineral resources there are certain minerals which are anticipated that they may be found in this particular location a report by government has says that uranium might be present over there there might be gold which might be present over there along with that ongc has ongc has recently said that oil and natural gas might be present over here this has not been proven as of now there are various theories but the pro, uh, the calculation work is under research and development. So, R&D is going on and in the days to come or years to come, this area may have the potential for uranium, gold, oil and natural gas as well. So, mineral resources are there, soil resources are there, which <coughs> is the requirement of this particular question. If we look, if we look at other aspects of the natural resources, again in continuation, the next point that comes up is solar energy why solar energy if we look again look at this region of deccan trap of india then focus over here in this entire region what is happening this is the location of western ghats here we are having western ghats and this section of the deccan trap is located in the rain shadow region of deccan of western ghats if Deccan Trap is located in the rain shadow region of Western Ghats, it means that the rainfall is comparatively less. If rainfall is comparatively less, we generally have, generally have an anticipation that this area receives 30 to 50 centimeter annual rainfall will look with local variation. 50 centimeter annual rainfall is not much. It means for maximum part of the year when the rainfall is not taking place, then there is no instability in atmosphere. The sky will remain clear if the sky will remain clear then it will be conducive it will be suitable for solar energy because solar energy works on sunlight if there is cloudy cover for maximum part of the year then that region is considered unsuitable for solar energy here we know that for maximum part in the year the sky remains clear so it becomes suitable for solar energy then have a look at another form of energy wind energy region is dry and it is on the eastern side of western ghats since the region is dry as a result wind energy is present over there insufficient quantity to have wind form so this region can also be harnessed for wind energy which becomes yet another section over which we can write a point on this particular question that is natural resources potential of deccan trap agriculture that is the black soil region then few minerals which are anticipated which are anticipated to be found in the deccan trap region solar energy wind energy becomes important right another thing section is that another point is that what is the natural resource potential what is the natural resource potential is that this particular region is close to coastal area is close to coastal area so infrastructure development is specifically related to ports storage hubs for storing the goods which need to be transported internationally it may become a destination for that that is the deccan trap because mumbai port jawaharlal nehru port kandala port goa marmagaon port these are the four 
major international ports of India. Out of six, four are located in the region of Deccan Tra. So it can be used as a source for international trade and it can be used as a logistic hub for various multinational companies who are involved in the process of manufacturing, who are engaged in the secondary sector in India. For that, it can be utilized, right? It will be considered as a natural resource. Why? Because the nearness of the Deccan region to the coastal area. And here we are having the presence of cheap labor. No one has inculcated or made the cheap labor reside in the Deccan area. Cheap labor is present over there because of lack of economic opportunity, because of failure of monsoon, because of highly dependent agriculture on monsoon. When the monsoon fails, the people are not having any labor. You must have heard about Vidarbha in Maharashtra that is known for farmer suicide. So if an alternative source is available, then cheap labor is available. It means this region can be developed for industrialization, right? So all these points will contribute to your answer on Deccan Trap and you are supposed to draw a map and show the region of Deccan Trap and its interconnected, uh, interconnectedness as well, right? That will be sufficient for this particular question. Next question. Examine the potential of wind energy in India and explain the reasons for their limited spatial spread. Now again, have a look. Examine the potential of wind energy in India and the reasons for its for their limited spatial spread. First of all, you are supposed to examine. When the keyword is examine, then you are supposed to write plus minus both. Examine and with a negative tone. Wind energy, potential of wind energy. If you are supposed to write or examine the potential of wind energy, which area will be having high wind energy? Wind energy is a type of energy in which windmills are rotated by the speed of the wind and that is connected to turbine which is connected to generator to a dynamo and finally electricity is produced right if we talk about the potential of wind energy then potential of wind energy can be present only in those locations where we are having high speed of wind so which area will be having higher speed of wind the answer is as simple as that, as that the entire coastal belt of india will be having high wind energy the entire coastal belt of India will be having high wind energy. If we talk exactly about the coastal area on the western side, then here we are having western guards and the western coastal plains are comparatively very narrow. If we talk about the eastern guards, eastern guards are wide and the eastern coastal plains are comparatively wide. So eastern coastal plains are having more potential for wind energy. Moreover, for maximum period of time, you have to write all this. India is under the influence of northeast trade winds so my, for maximum part of the year wind is blowing in this direction so if we use this western coast for wind farms it will be affected by the leeward effect of the western guard but if we look at this side here it will be directly affected by the trade winds and if we take eastern guards into consideration then it will be affected by the windward side so the speed will be high here the wind is moving over the oceanic area this is what this is bay of bengal so if wind is moving over the oceanic area, since no friction is there, there is no object to offer friction as a result, the speed of the wind increases. And when it enters the coastal area, it is having high speed. And then after interacting with the mangrove belts over there, interacting with the housings, interacting with the buildings and the vegetation over there, then the speed reduces. So this area is having high potential for wind energy. Apart from that, Gujarat and Rajasthan. Rajasthan is a desert area. Again, the same principle due to lack of human habitation, due to le less human habitation, there are less uh, constructed houses, there are less buildings, there are less vegetation and so the wind is having high speed in desert area. Gujarat, the coastal area is having high speed. So Gujarat, Rajasthan becomes the potential hubs for wind energy. Apart from that, Tamil Nadu has eventually developed wind energy farms and they are working nicely, right? So the potential of wind energy is present in our country, India. But it is not being harnessed at the rate at which we are having the potential. And so the question says, explain the reasons for their limited spatial spread. Limited spatial spread, one is the natural reasons that here we are having less wind speed, here the wind speed is high, but the region is having 
the economic status of the area is not up to the par. Here the people are having subsistence type of, type of agriculture. They are not having extra money because here it is three crops of rice in a year. On the western coast, it is industrialized coast. But the, uh, but the uh, problem is that here the western coastal strip is quite narrow. The average width of the western coastal plain is only 10 kilometers. So the land is already too very costly. If the that land is, con is transferred to this wind energy, then the cost of the wind energy establishment increases so very high that it mars the profit of this particular industry. So it becomes one of the reasons for the limited spatial spread. Then here in coastal areas, there is lack of connectivity of wind farms to the grid. So the energy that is produced that is not connected to the grid due to lack of availability of grid, these wind uh, energy farms uh, faces problem. Then investment, how to invest, it, it is becoming a costly affair. So how to get the money for that investment that again is a problematic task because the gestation period is not so very small. And in order to attract good investment, you require a uh, small gestation period so that lowered by the high profits, lowered by the early profits, entrepreneurs may, lie, may feel it a good industry to invest and that sector is lacking. I already explained to you that a land cost is increasing specifically on the western coast land cost is very high even in Tamil Nadu all the wind farms are in a specific cluster only and around those farms the land cost is becoming so very high that if we divide the total percentage of establishing a wind farm unit then the maximum share goes to the land cost it is a problem another problem is that when we talk about when we talk about the wind farms and the policy on wind farms, then in India we are having federalism, central and states. Whenever any plan policy is framed out by the central government, then it automatically enjoys or it enjoys the stamp of government of India of the entire country India as a whole and so when international investment has to be attracted when FDI is to be attracted then central government plans and policies are having a more greater say in international fora as compared to states wind energy up till now till very recently has been dominated by the states and whenever states try to attract any investment in the form of FDI then it is not having the same value it is not having it is not considered at par with the investment proposal given by the central government and the dispute between the central and the state becomes problematic so it is also a reason for its limited spatial spread apart from that other cheaper modes of energy generation which are not so very highly dependent on, co on cost, on input cost, they are available. Solar energy is a cheaper mode of transport and India being a tropical country is having immense amount of sunlight throughout the year, depending, except a few locations which are having very high rainfall and cloud cover is there. Otherwise, sufficient quantity of sunlight is there. Government is subsidizing the solar panels the raw material for the manufacturing of solar panels silica that is found in india that is available in, in india in abundance and so the rate is comparatively less and so due to availability of other cheaper modes of energy generation this wind energy section is facing a lopsided approach both by the government and the entrepreneurs in our country india so this will be sufficient to answer this particular question that is explain the reasons for the limited special spread. When I am speaking out, I am speaking out many sentences. But you are supposed to get the idea, right? And that idea has to be compressed in this word limit, 150 words. If the ideas are flowing, then you can exceed the word limit by even 10% or even by 20%. But if you are having a flow of idea, if each single sentence, a small sentence is having altogether a different idea, otherwise you will have to restrict your answer in 150 words. Next question, 
what are the forces that influence ocean currents describe their role in fishing industry of the world now here have a look at a question i already told you that in 2015 the same question was asked more or less the same question and now the question is again there in front of you and here the question is for 250 words it is a 15 mark so before attempting this question you have to read the marks that what is the marks assigned to the question and for how many marks you are supposed to write it so what are the forces that influence the ocean currents one part of the question describe their role in fishing industry of the world now it depends upon the whims and fancies of the upsc whether both parts of the question will be evaluated on an equal note or whether one part will be having more weightage as compared to other part right so you are supposed to balance your answer and you have to answer the question in totality without making any differences first part what are the factors that influence the ocean current what what are the forces i'm sorry what are the forces that influence the ocean current so it is asking about the forces and if you, even if the term is used forces in fact it is asking about the factors which influence the ocean currents when we talk about the factors which influence the ocean currents then temperature or you can say insulation becomes one of the factors for the genesis of ocean currents rotation of earth becomes one of the factors Coriolis force becomes one of the factors salinity salinity of oceans becomes one of the factors prevailing winds becomes one of the factors for the genesis of ocean currents alternate distribution of oceans and continents alternate distribution of oceans and continents becomes another factor for the genesis of ocean currents and since they have in the second part of the question they are writing about the fishing industry so <coughs> this factor has to be written without fail that is ablation ablation has to be incorporated without fail ablation is what ablation is melting of ice by melting off of ice we get the formation of cold current and for fishing to become dominant it is necessary that the confluence of warm and cold current must take place when the warm and the cold current will meet each other it results in the formation of a fishing bank right and for cold current to initiate ablation is one of the primary sources because the remarkable difference between the temperature of warm and cold current has to be there and so if the water is or the current is formed by ablation that is the melting of ice then it will be having far low temperature as compared to warm current no matter whether they are moving more or less on the same latitude and they confluence with each other at one single point even then a current formed by ablation will be having less temperature so how the temperature plays the role the region which experiences high temperature there the water expands becomes lighter and starts moving out and as a result upwelling of water take place in that particular region rotation earth rotates from west to east as a result surface water move from east to west and when the surface water move from east to west then the alternate distribution of ocean and continents have a look we are having if you uh, can recall the map we are having pacific ocean american continent atlantic ocean africa and europe then indian ocean then again southeast asia and australia then again pacific ocean so ocean continent ocean continent ocean continent it, uh, in reality that is the distribution of ocean and continents so alternate distribution of ocean and continent becomes one of the reasons for genesis of ocean currents correlates force as it is applicable in climatology it works it works over the moving water towards right in northern hemisphere and towards left in southern hemisphere as a result we get a clockwise circulation in northern hemisphere and an anti-clockwise circulation in southern hemisphere salinity salinity is what amount of dissolved salt in measured in grams per 1000 grams of oceanic water so if the salinity is high then the water will be heavy heavy water will have tendency to move down right and if the salinity is less then the less salinity water will have tendency to move right when the water moves up it brings along with it the nutrients from the lower layer which reaches the upper layer results in the formation of nascent oxygen and plankton is produced when the plankton is produced plankton is what it is a fish food so fishes will flock to that particular region in search of food as a result it will be known for fishing industry prevailing winds the winds that move they drag 
the surface ocean water in a particular direction and hence these prevailing winds result in the formation of ocean currents. It is also one of the major reasons due to the, for the genesis of ocean currents that is called as prevailing winds. So these are the forces that influence the ocean currents. What are ocean currents? You will start the, your answer with a single statement. What are ocean currents? Ocean currents are like rivers <coughs> flowing in the oceanic area on the surface from one place to another. They are dependent on such and such and such factors and you need to explain all the factors. Then the second part of the question, describe their role in fishing industry of the world. <coughs> How the ocean currents are having a role in the development of fishing industry of the world? For that you, have, you will have to explain, suppose we are having a cold current and here we are having a warm current. Then when the cold and the warm current meet each other, then the air above the warm current is having high temperature, air above the cold current is having less temperature. High temperature means high humidity. Here the humidity is sub, uh, sufficiently high, it means relative humidity is comparatively high. Here it is less temperature. When the less temperature will combine with high relative humidity air, then what will happen? Condensation will initiate. Condensation is taking place on the oceanic region. So this area will be marked with very high fog. When the fog will be very high, as a result, the region will become unsuitable for navigation. So ships cannot move across because Till now, 2022, even to this day, none of the developed countries of the world even are having any remedy for fog. So if any region is having fog, then it becomes unsuitable for transport. And here the warm and the cold current are meeting 24 into 7 into 365. Then what will happen? It will be having less temperature. Here will be high relative humidity. Fog will be present almost throughout the year. So the region becomes unsuitable, unsuitable for human interference, for anthropogenic activities. Any region which becomes aware the human beings are not able to interfere, that region becomes rich in biodiversity. And if we talk about marine biodiversity, fishing is a part and uh, fishes are a part and parcel of marine biodiversity. So such a region will be rich in fishes. Apart from that, if you look, when the cold current is coming and the warm current is coming, wherever cold and warm water meet, it results in the formation of nascent oxygen. When the nascent oxygen is being formed, it results in the formation of plankton and that plankton is a fish food. So fish food is there, fog is there, human interference is not there, so it becomes suitable for fishing. Moreover, another factor that is that makes this region important is that we are having the presence of continental shelf. <laughs> Suppose this is the mean sea level and this is the continental shelf. This is the continental area, this is the mean sea level and the confluence of warm and cold water takes place over here. Then only this region will be called uh, for as a fishing bank. Just the confluence of cold and warm water will not increase the number and the quantum of fishes over there. If it is working on continental shelf, only then it will happen because first of all, continental shelf will be having marine photosynthetic plants over there that will add oxygen to this particular region. Pro apart from that, they provide as a good support base for the fishes, right? And so this region becomes suitable for fishing. If the same cold and warm current meet in somewhere in the midway of the ocean, that region will also be having more fishes. But the quantum over here and over there is having no comparison. Here the quantity of fishes will flourish like anything. And so <coughs> this is the role of the ocean currents in the fishing industry, right? Upwelling, downwelling I explained you and the second part is confluence of warm and cold current. You need to write or on the distribution of this particular section, have a look. Have a look at the world map. This is the location of equator. On the northern side of equator, here we are having the current that is called as Gulf Stream. This current is called as Gulf Stream. Here, from here by ablation, we get a current that is called as Labrador current. Labrador current is the cold current. Gulf Stream is the warm current. They confluence each other along Newfoundland. And along Newfoundland, we get the formation of a fishing bank, which is called as Grand Fishing Bank. Right, that is called as Grand Fishing Bank. Then, later on, Gulf Stream moves forward as 
North Atlantic drift. It is supported by the Westerlies and so it is called as now drift. It moves forward. A part of this North Atlantic drift reaches the coast of Norway and here it is called as Norwegian warm current. It is known as Norwegian warm current and if you look, it is not shown in this particular map, if you look at the northwestern side of Norway, it is highly zigzag. If you will look in your atlases, you will find that it is highly zigzag. It is having coastal cuts. These coastal cuts are called as fjords. They are called as fjords. Fjords are having the cold polar and subpolar waters. The original temperature at this particular region is comparatively less. So it is having cold waters and the warm Norwegian current reaches over there. So the warm cold water Sorry, the warm water of the Norwegian current and the cold polar water confluences uh, with each other here on the northwestern side of Norway, which again results in the formation of a fishing bank, which is called as Great Fishing Bank. Here it was Grand Fishing Bank, and this is called a Great Fishing Bank. Got that? Then, in the same manner, a section of this North Atlantic drift enters the English Channel. This is the English Channel. English Channel is between UK and France. Here it is English Channel, the current enters over there, this current is called as Rennell current. Rennell was the person who discovered this current, who found this current, it is named after him, it is Rennell current and it is a warm current and it reaches the region of North Sea, this is North Sea. Again North Sea is close to the polar region, it is having cold waters. The cold waters of North Sea and the warm Rennell current provides the required criteria for confluence of warm and cold water and we got the get the formation of third fishing bank of the world over here which is called as dogger fishing bank it is on the uh, on the eastern coast of uk and if you look at the north sea if you will look in your atlases in the north sea north sea is one of the most shallow uh, shallow, uh, shallow sea of the world it is having very less depth in fact this entire north sea work as a continental shelf here the continental shelf was of newfoundland here the continental shelf of Norway and here the entire North Sea is a continental shelf and the eastern coast of UK works as a continental shelf. And there is a fourth fishing bank which is formed over here. From here the current that moves northward is called as Kuroshio. From the north we get the current, cold current that is called as Oyashio. Oyashio and Kuroshio confluences on the eastern coast of Japan and results in the formation of the fourth fishing bank of the world and that is called as Japan fishing bank. It is also known as Nippon fishing bank. Nippon is the old name of Japan. It is also known as Honshu fishing bank because Honshu is the largest island of Japan having the capital Tokyo and the maximum part of the fishing bank is located on the Honshu island. So also called as Honshu or Nippon or Japan fishing bank by the confluence of Kuroshio and Oyashio. Right? In this manner, we get the fishing activities dominant. Then, have a look over here, along the coast of Peru, here, due to upwelling, we get very prominent fishing. The economy of Peru is dependent on fishing. Why? Because upwelling of water takes place. In the same manner, along the coastal areas of India, fishing is a dominant economic activity. All the coastal areas are having dominant fishing as a dominant activity and even there, Fooding habits is dependent on fish, uh, from, uh, dependent upon ocean catch because whatever that is available naturally becomes a fooding habit of that particular region. It has nothing to do with the liking and disliking. Whatever we eat from a childhood that becomes a fooding habit. And since the people who reside on the coastal area they are having fish as a staple food, so they are dependent on fishes. That will be sufficient for you all to answer this particular question. That is. What are the forces that influence ocean currents? Describe their role in fishing industry of the world, right? So how it is adding to the economy of the region, you have to answer that and you have to restrict your discussion to 250 words. Keep that in mind. Next question is, describing the distribution of rubber producing countries indicate major environmental issues faced by them. Now again, the question is a 250 uh, word question and it is a 15 marker. You have to describe the distribution of rubber producing countries and the major environmental issues faced by them. So again it is having two parts. In those two parts you have to balance your answer. The first part is distribution of rubber producing countries. Now 
what is exactly meant by rubber what is rubber and how will you decide that what are rubber producing countries then rubber is requires a temperature of 25 degrees celsius or more than that it requires minimum rainfall of 200 cm annual rainfall or more than that and soil is not a constraint it can be grown on number of types of soil and the soil is not a constraint but soil has to be there right so if these conditions are available then it becomes suitable for rubber cultivation now high temperature of 25 degree celsius we are talking about average annual temperature along with 200 cm average annual rainfall if you look at these figures and you are having some knowledge of geography you can clearly demarcate it is something related to equatorial type of climate if it is something related to equatorial climate type of climate then those regions which are on equator or close to equator will be dominant for rubber cultivation so rubber is an equatorial crop it depends upon high temperature high rainfall and so it is dependent on high humidity as well since it is dependent on high temperature high humidity high rainfall so it becomes equatorial crop if we talk about equatorial crop then the term specifically suggests that all those crops which are specific to equatorial region but if we talk about our country only if we talk about our country that is called as india then many parts over here are having equatorial vegetation if you look at andaman and nicobar island these are having equatorial vegetation it is slightly away from equator but yet it is having equatorial vegetation so not only equator <laughs> if the tropical or even the subtropical regions if they are having the required climatic conditions then they will be considered suitable for rubber cultivation even if you are not having any idea about the distribution of rubber producing regions in the world you now know that tropical and subtropical regions also provided the required conditions are there average annual temperature of 25 degrees celsius so it will be suitable for rubber cultivation if we talk about the distribution of rubber cultivation uh, rubber producing countries then again <coughs> basically thailand is the largest producer of rubber in the world now earlier it was malaysia and if you are following the newspaper if you are following the hindu newspaper or the indian express then since last 6 months there had been a debate on rubber <coughs> this rubber producing country if we there had been a debate on the status of rubber in our country india and even in last 15 days twice there had been an article in hindu newspaper which had discussed on rubber right the problems the plight the trauma of the people who are engaged in rubber production rubber production so if you follow the hindu newspaper you get the topic from there and when you do the analysis out there you will get a pragmatic understanding about the topic so distribution of rubber producing countries those countries which are having which are on equator and which are known for rubber so maximum part of southeast asia thailand malaysia laos vietnam cambodia southern part of india andaman and nicobar section of india parts of brazil some part of central america that is the major region where we are having the distribution of rubber so rubber is produced in these particular regions but that is natural rubber if the term here is only term here is rubber rubber producing countries so there are two types of rubber natural rubber and synthetic rubber when we talk about a synthetic rubber then usa europe china japan will also come into play right so they can also be mentioned as a single line but you have to consider a question as per natural rubber only because it is indicating about the environmental issues faced by them and specific to rubber right so this will be the distribution and if you talk about the major environmental issues faced by them now rubber is a crop that requires high quantity of water if plantation of rubber has to be carried out then some other uh, natural vegetation has to be removed so it results in deforestation it results in deforestation this is major environmental issues faced by them so deforestation becomes an outcome of flourishing of rubber industry deforestation apart from deforestation if you look then loss of 
biodiversity that is flora and fauna loss of biodiversity that is flora and fauna take place loss of habitat take place if the deforestation will take place then some of the wild animal animals uh, will be losing their habitat and so deforestation loss of biodiversity loss of habitat they becomes the natural environmental implications then depletion of water since it is a water intensive crop right so it, even if water is not available the roots will try to suck maximum from underground water table so depletion of underground water take place apart from that what can be the other environmental issues when this rubber is produced then what what will you do with the natural rubber will it be directly sold in the market no the lat latex has to be processed when it has to be processed it means it has to be taken to some processing industry what is the processing industry that is chemical industry and when processing has to be done by the chemical industry then it means burning of that latex is required it has to be heated up for that firewood coal is used which again results to pollution so <coughs> the indirect linkage of growing of rubber is growth of chemical industries as well which will degrade the environment in the long run so these can be assembled and can be written in a structured manner one after another which will help you to answer the second part of the question that in indicate the major environmental issues faced by them by whom by rubber producing countries so what are the environmental issues faced by the rubber producing countries as you can enumerate in this manner right that's all for this particular question let's move on to next question mention the significance of states and so much in international trade as i already told you mention the significance of states and so much in international trade states is so much in crt class 6 it is given over here what is meant by state what is meant by so much it is a 15 marker you have to write into 50 words so you have to write on states and stomas. What is basically a strait? A strait is the narrow channel of water, narrow body of water, which connects two larger water bodies. A narrow channel of water which connects two larger water bodies. Or it is a narrow passage of water which separates two land masses. That is called as a strait. What is an isthmus? An isthmus is a narrow strip of land which connects two big land masses narrow strip of land connecting two big land masses or alternatively a narrow strip of land separating two major oceans two mega oceans or even two small seas now let us have a look at the major states and isthmuses which are present over the world let us have a look at the states here Florida Strait, connecting Gulf of Mexico to Atlantic Ocean. Here, Hudson Strait, connecting Hudson Bay to Atlantic Ocean. Here, here it is Dover Strait. Right, here it is Strait of Gibraltar. Here it is Park Strait. Here it is Strait of Malacca. And here it is something that had been in news in last one and a half month Taiwan Strait, right? Here you can have a look Torres Strait, right? All these states which are present here it is Bass Strait. All these states. What is the importance of these states? If you look at all these states on both the sides of these states, we are having the land masses. So they are used as a channel through which navigation takes place. Now why navigation is important? The question arises, why navigation is important? We are discussing about states. So why navigation is important? Because maximum volume as per as value of the international trade take place through navigation. What are the modes of transport available? The modes of transport which are available are air, water, railways and 
this oceanic waterways right if we talk about airways it is quite expensive if we talk about roadways then across the oceans road connectivity is impossible even in the neighboring ocean like all weather friend of india pakistan can we make roads over here another all weather friend over here china can we make roads over here no it is not possible so how to carry out the international trade then the next way is airways we have discussed roadways i told you railways is also not possible the only thing that is left is navigation that is the waterways another reason for choosing navigation is that it is the cheapest it is the cheapest mode of transport which is available it is slow it is time consuming but it is cost efficient it is the cheapest mode of transport available and the difference between the cost involved by road air road or air transport or railway transport is much 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 high as compared to navigation so when we have to decide on the product on the cost of commodities then a minimum transport cost is the need of our so as to make the commodities goods competitive in the international market and so navigation is chosen so i am saying that the maximum value and maximum volume of international trade is carried through navigation now when it has to move through vessels through ships then ships have to move through these regions for example if india has to send something to north america then this will be the route for example it has to start from mumbai so this will be the route it will enter over here right it will move into a state of babal mandap red sea suez canal mediterranean sea a state of gibraltar and you will reach new york same route has to be followed for the countries of north africa for the entire section of europe if india has to send something to china then this will be the route and it will be moving in this manner so it is strait of malacca if this and these straits were not there if this suez canal was not there then how can india reach north america this will be the route it will be so very lengthy so it will be uh, involving high cost more time right if europe has to send something to india then this will be the route so is it an easy option no so these routes are not followed rather this route is followed when we talk about these routes then these routes are full of straits strait of gibraltar as i discussed all these the straits so they work as a channel but then what is the difference between the straits and the normal open seas straits are narrow passages so on both the sides of strait we get generally we get two different countries so if there are two different countries then over a short distance of time ships can move and can transport the goods and commodities from one place to another moreover when the ships are moving in the open ocean many a time during emergency they need help and if they are crossing the straits then the land area continental area is nearby and so they work as a port of call for example in lakshadweep work as a port of call for this sea route here is state of malacca so singapore and indonesia work as a port of call right so it becomes important that is about straits if we talk about if we talk about a sthumas then most famous sthumas sthumas of panama and here we they have constructed a canal that is called as panama canal and the countries through which the panama canal passes are called as pcn countries right panama canal over there so if anything has to move from this coastal area to this coastal area or from here to here then instead of tracking this route this is not followed it is moved through panama canal and reaches over here so it reduces the time it saves the cost in the same manner here we are having the suez canal which has made the movement of goods from india to europe or india to north america or northern countries of africa through red sea via suez canal in the same manner here it is not very clear in this particular map in your, in your atlas you can check over here here you are having a country that is called as denmark south of denmark you are having the country that is called as germany on the northern part of germany you are having a town that is called as kiel and through kiel a canal has been constructed in this manner which connect the eastern and the western sea north sea is connected to baltic sea right that is the kiel canal in the same manner here in malaysia you are having a place that is called as kra 
and through kra a canal has been constructed which is which connects both the sides of the uh, sea and that is called as kra canal these are also considered as small isthmus only right so isthmus assist in reducing the time in making the transit cost effective effective time efficient and these isthmus have been dug out over the period of time and canals have been made if we talk about the panama canal panama canal is made into different sections of canal each section is having different altitude so a ship is allowed to move in a section then the water is pumped in ship moves up it moves to other section and then again moves to other section in the same manner it moves down because the height of the land area is comparatively more red sea is one of the busiest sea routes because all international trade of this entire region over here this entire north america central america anglo america europe northern parts of africa and even the countries over here they move through this region and reach india or southeast asia or oceania or asia pacific over here right so it becomes very much centric for the growth and development of the country if you talk about india here we are having park street here we are having between india and sri lanka the water body is called as park state it is again very important it is geopolitically important it is geo strategically important as well as for international trade right so mention the significance of states in so much in international trade you are supposed to define so much you are supposed to define what is a state and then you are supposed to give multiple examples as many as you can recall there can be hundreds of example as many as you can recall you need to put in over there and write the significance of states and isthmus in general and if you know some specific data you can write specific as well that will not make any much difference whether you are writing specific or you are writing in general the question is about awareness how well you are able to present your view point because the question is very straight forward very simple question and it is assigned 15 marks so if a 15 marks is given to a simple question it means your mind has to work in order to make the answer attractive so that examiner gets attracted and give you good mark i think it will be the last question troposphere is a, a very significant atmospheric layer that determines whether processes how now again a very direct question troposphere is given right from class 6 ncert to in all the textbooks whether you are reading higher books or normal books troposphere everyone knows that if we look at if we look at the general structure suppose on this side we are having equator here we are having the 90 degree polar area and we look at troposphere then the height of troposphere is almost 18 kilometers on equator and it is approximately 8 kilometers on the polar area this layer is called as troposphere this is surface of earth over troposphere we are having the presence of this layer that is called as ozone we are having the presence of this layer that is called as ozone and a question is asking troposphere is a very significant atmospheric layer that determines whether processes how so first of all define troposphere so troposphere is like a blanket of earth it is the most dense layer of earth of earth's atmosphere having maximum pressure and density as we move up in troposphere pressure temperature density all three reduces as we move up in atmosphere uh, up in troposphere then the rate of reduction of temperature is called as normal lapse rate right in troposphere since it is uh, having very high density at the bottom it is able to trap the terrestrial radiation the radiation which is radiated by the earth that radiation is trapped and thereby the temperature of the troposphere increases the temperature of this particular layer increases which helps in keeping the planet warm and that temperature which is maintained by troposphere is very much centric for the growth of life on this planet earth so this earth is a blue planet because of this layer troposphere next point tri meridional wind system or tri cellular wind system that is the headly cell feral cell and polar cell are present in troposphere only so the troposphere houses these cells 
these cells are the are the source for the permanent wind or planetary winds which are again responsible for modulating the global temperature the global temperature distribution from polar area to equatorial area and from equatorial area to polar area is due to that tri meridional wind system which is housed very much in within troposphere only right if we talk about upward movement of air the vertical movement of air that is present only in troposphere other layers are not having much vertical movement or the pronounce or the specific vertical movement of air is present in troposphere only. So, since vertical movement of air is there, therefore when the air goes up, the atmospheric pressure acting on the rising air reduces and so the temperature of the rising packet of air falls adiabatically which results in various weather processes, condensation results in the formation of clouds. Clouds are responsible for various types of precipitation, may it be drizzle, rainfall, hail, sleet, snowfall, any type of precipitation will be an after effect of cloud only. So these are the weather processes which are related to that. Movement of air from one place to another from high pressure to low pressure, that is the winds. It is, it is responsible for the formation or the formation of subtropical high pressure belt, equatorial low pressure belt, subpolar low pressure belt and the polar high pressure belt is, in, is due to the movement of air taking place in troposphere only. Then another factor, troposphere is having the movement of jet streams. So jet streams move in the upper part of troposphere which influences, which creates alternate high and low pressure on the ground and ever influences and modulates the weather phenomena and the weather conditions on the surface of earth. These jet streams are present in troposphere only. Insulation is held maximum in troposphere. Troposphere is having maximum density of gases. Apart from gases, it is also having dust particles. These dust particles right from the surface of earth up till the earth upper part of troposphere act as hygroscopic nuclei around which condensation take place. When the condensation take place close to the surface of earth, it takes the form of mist, fog. When the same condensation take place in upper atmosphere, it takes the form of cloud, right? So these dust particles are also present over here. If we talk about carbon part, if we talk about carbon dioxide, then carbon dioxide, a molecule of carbon dioxide floats literally in this manner in troposphere only, right? It is responsible for global warming. When the insulate, when the returning radiation is trapped by carbon dioxide, which is a constant of troposphere, then the temperature of the entire troposphere starts increasing. The increment of uh, temperature of troposphere is what is termed as global warming. And the amplifi amplification of that increase in temperature over the polar region is called as Arctic amplification. And thereby, if the global temperature increases by 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius, then over the Arctic area, the temperature may increase by even 4, 5 or 6 degrees Celsius. It will result in huge melting of ice. So it is again a process. Each and every aspect of climatology will be having direct or indirect relation to troposphere. Right. So troposphere is a very significant atmospheric layer that determines weather processes. How give a general brief introduction about the troposphere, the structure of troposphere, the whereabouts of troposphere, and then related to each and every weather process that you know, and that can be related to troposphere some way or the other. Right. In this manner, we have discussed all the questions that were based on geography in GS paper one. All the eight questions that turned up in this examination of 2022 we have discussed and the only approach that has to be followed is that do not block your minds into compartments into segments and keep your mind open that how much you can write and what is the diversity that you can give to your answer. If you are successful in doing that then the sky is the limit and you will get very good marks in your examination. With this we conclude with the uh, with session of UPSC GS paper 1 discussion. We have discussed each and every question. Our entire team has discussed that. Still, if you people are having any doubts, any questions, you are free to contact us anytime. And uh, you can contact on our websites. The contact, the method to contact the institute is given over there. Please follow it. Thank you so much.